Damon mentioned to Robert that Andrew liked whiskey, so Robert bought a few expensive bottles of limited edition Kentucky bourbon as a gift. The last time Damon bought whiskey for Andrew, Andrew treasured it so much that it took him a year to go through it. He'd only open it on special occasions and sip conservatively. Now Andrew was swimming in liquor. He thought he'd die and gone to heaven. You like it? Robert asked. Andrew swirled the bourbon around in his mouth and savored the taste. It's sublime. Very good. Robert's eyes twinkled. I'll send you a few cases so you don't run out. How does that sound? Andrew widened his eyes. No, I couldn't possibly accept such a gift. Nonsense! Robert chuckled as he refilled their glasses. I have a lot of this bourbon at my house. Parting with a few cases won't kill me. Danny's father Gordon frowned. This tastes like a cheap knockoff, he commented. He still didn't know the Brokerton's social status. Andrew shook his head. I assure you it's the real thing. Gordon furrowed his brow. Do you know how much these bottles are worth? Ordinary people can't afford to purchase a single bottle, much less multiple cases. It's been double barrel age for years. It takes a decade to produce. I don't believe it. Andrew raised his eyebrows. He knew the whiskey was expensive, but he didn't have an idea of the exact price. How much? He asked. Gordon scribbled a number on a slip of paper and slid it to Andrew. Robert looked embarrassed. Andrew's jaw dropped. No way it costs that much. Gordon nodded. Not only does it cost thousands of dollars to produce a bottle, but the bourbon itself is priceless. You can't buy it even if you wanted to. It's a collector's item. If you take the whole box, I'm afraid you'll be able to bring down the entire national inventory. That's why I assume it's fake. Paulina walked into the living room, wiping her hands on a dish towel. There are too many fake liquors and cigars in the world now. You must learn to recognize them. Gordon agreed. My wife speaks the truth. If this was real, you'd have to have a special supplier. The annual production is limited. Owning multiple cases of this whiskey is reserved for multi-billionaires. And judging by the condition of this house, I don't think you're anywhere close to that. There was a sense of superiority in his words. Andrew pursed his lips. Well, that's rather judgmental. Anyway, I trust Robert. He wouldn't swindle me. Try the bourbon. I promise you'll find it delicious. Gordon took a small sip. He closed his eyes, lost in the flavor. A warm feeling rushed through his body. How could fake whiskey taste so good? He'd only tried the real thing once. And if his memory served correctly, this was just as good if not better. It's nice, he commented. He didn't want to lose face in front of Andrew and Robert. Andrew smiled. As I said, it's the best of the best. Robert could tell that Gordon didn't believe him but he didn't care to be questioned by working-class men from Iowa with superiority complexes. Dinner was ready. They sat at the table and dug into the exquisite dishes. After a round of wine and three helpings of meat and vegetables, Paulina dabbed her mouth with a cloth napkin. Who cooked these dishes? Mrs. Walker, your seasoning is divine. Mrs. Walker beamed at Nancy. I can't take any credit. It was my dear friend. She has the best recipes. Paulina furrowed her brow. Is that so? Well, it's delicious, if I do say so myself. May I ask what this dish is called? She pointed to a platter in the center of the table. That's roasted lamb with balsamic mint reduction sauce. Nancy answered. Paulina took another bite. She had to admit the food tasted heavenly. Yes, yes, yes. I was fortunate enough to accompany my husband to attend some of his work-related events. I've tasted lamb like this before. Where did you learn how to cook? Are you a chef? Nancy shook her head and smiled. I'm not a chef, but I have picked up some useful skills throughout my life. Paulina sipped her wine. I would love to learn how to cook, but I'm afraid I don't have the spare time. We have a housekeeper who also cooks for us. She's quite good. Oh, right. Does Selena know how to cook? Mrs. Walker puffed up with pride. The dishes Selena cooks are even better than mine. They might even be better than Nancy's. Paulina laughed. Excellent. I'll have to try Selena's cooking if she expects to marry into our family. Mrs. Walker's smile faded. She couldn't take it any longer. Paulina, I mean no disrespect, but I think young people nowadays have different views from us elders. Young married couples should live separately from their families to avoid conflict and confusion. Paulina frowned. When the time comes, we'll see how it goes. I'm a traditional woman. If a woman wants to marry my son, I expect she will keep the house clean and put dinner on the table every night. Mrs. Walker set down her fork. I appreciate that you want your son to be taken care of, but that's a lot to ask of modern young women. My daughter has dreams and ambitions. I'd hate to see her get sidetracked and forget about her goals. Paulina slid an envelope across the table. If they decide to get married, my husband and I are willing to put $2,000 toward the wedding. 
If you don't have any objections, please accept it. Danny was mortified. His mother was embarrassing him. He discussed this with the, his parents beforehand, and they agreed not to talk about money at the dinner table. They were going back on their word. Anyway, the Walkers were humble people. A wedding in South Rivertown would cost at least $30,000. Wasn't two grand a paltry amount for the groom's family to offer? Danny glared at his mother and pinched her leg, but she ignored him. Mrs. Walker was a gracious woman. She accepted the envelope. What a generous gift, Paulina! When Paulina saw Mrs. Walker's expression, she thought she had given too much. She was proud and at the same time felt a little heartache. If she had known earlier, she would have given less. Well, consider it a token of our approval. Paulina sniffed. When they marry, we'll give a couple thousand more. Danny's eyes widened again. They had agreed to give him $2,000 as a wedding gift. Why were they changing the amount of their gift? Mrs. Walker bit her lip. She could tell that Paulina and Gordon Litchfield didn't have a high opinion of their family. Dear, isn't that too little? We don't ask for much, but I feel we should be splitting the wedding expenses. Perhaps we should let the kids decide how they want to spend the money. Instead of throwing an extravagant wedding, they could use it as startup funds for a honeymoon or a down payment on a house. Selena was getting anxious. Mom, it's okay. We can accept the money and use it as we see fit. Mrs. Walker shook her head. That doesn't sit right with me. Your father and I have saved for years to give you a good future. Housing prices have skyrocketed in South Rivertown since the developers took over. I don't think it's uncouth to ask to share the expense with your fiancé's parents. Paulina chugged the remainder of her wine and slammed the glass on the table. How dare you ask for more money? What is this, a dowry? Mrs. Walker was unfazed. Look, Mrs. Litchfield, we both come from humble backgrounds. The kids want to get married. It would be insulting if we didn't split the cost. I think I'm being more than reasonable. Danny piped up. Mom, Mrs. Walker's right. Selena's family shouldn't be expected to foot the cost of the entire wedding just because they're the bride's parents. Danny thought his mother was disrespecting Selena. He couldn't remain silent. Paulina glowered at her son. Daniel Litchfield, please do not talk back to me, especially when we're in polite company. Danny shrank back. He tried to stand for Selena, but he was terrified of his mother. Mrs. Walker took a bite of lamb. Our daughter is an outstanding young woman. We want what's best for her. Paulina nodded. I believe you. Otherwise, I wouldn't have come all the way here. But marriage is not a matter of two young people. It involves two families. Selena is a good girl, but I don't know how our families can compare. Mrs. Walker looked down at her plate and folded her hands in her lap. If her daughter couldn't marry the man of her dreams due to her petty family squabbles, Mrs. Walker would never forgive herself. Paulina refilled her wine glass. Everyone could see she was a little tipsy. Mrs. Walker... If you ask for my money, it seems that you're selling your daughter to the highest bidder. I know I told you that I'm an old-fashioned woman, but that's going too far. Nancy felt bad for Mrs. Walker. When she saw that her friend was struggling, she decided to intervene. Pauline, Mrs. Litchfield, it appears you have some misgivings about a union that should be joyous. What if I told you that Selena will be set financially for the rest of her life? Paulina threw her head back and laughed. Yeah, right. I saw the other houses in this crummy neighborhood. It's practically a shantytown. I don't expect to see a single cent from this working class family. You have to understand that I'm just trying to protect my son. Selena's hand shook. It was one thing if Danny's parents disapproved of her, but how dare they talk down to her family? What made Selena even more disappointed was that Danny didn't have any opinions. No matter if it was right or wrong, he would listen to his mother. While Selena felt deeply disappointed, she made a decision. She smiled sweetly. Mrs. Litchfield, thank you for your generosity, but we don't need your money. I'm in love with your son. I'm willing to marry him, even if we have to elope at the courthouse and have a backyard barbecue to celebrate. Paulina snorted. Selena, that's a cute idea, but you won't even have the money to cater a party of 50 people. Let the adults discuss the matter. Selena fingered her necklace. It was the Tears of the Moon pink diamond necklace Nancy gave her. Do you like my necklace? Nancy gave it to me. Do you know how much it cost? Paulina didn't like Selena's tone. She rolled her eyes and asked, How much? I'm sure it's not more than one or two hundred dollars, judging by the house you live in. You didn't even send a car to receive us at the airport. What kind of family arrives in a taxi? This necklace is worth more than two million dollars. Additionally, my brother gave me this emerald bracelet. What do you think? Do you like how it catches the light? Selena stretched out her wrist for emphasis. I admit that it might not be appropriate to use a taxi to pick you up today. But my parents don't know how to drive, and my brother has been to Meyerson, so he didn't buy a car. 
Still, they arrived on time to receive you at the airport. Paulina gulped her wine. She hated when people called her out on her bad behavior. Selena leaned over the table. Furthermore, most people in the old town don't have cars. It's wasteful. We rely on taxi drivers to get us from point A to B. We relish giving them income. My mother won't disparage you, but I will. She's waited on you hand and foot since you arrived in South Rivertown. Nancy cooked you a delicious feast. They're doing this because they love me, not because they care about you. I don't want to embarrass myself, but I feel that I have to stand up and say something to my mothers. All I ask for is a little respect. Paulina widened her eyes. Selena, you must be joking. How can you talk to me like that? If you're serious, your jewelry alone could buy three houses. Who are you trying to fool? Paulina took a closer look at Selena's necklace and bracelet. Though she didn't want to admit it, the gems were flawless. Selena only smiled. She already said too much. Damon watched this exchange thoughtfully. Damon suddenly thought of buying a gift for Nancy. Until now, Damon could never purchase a gift from Nancy and Robert. Although they were wealthy and could buy anything their hearts desired, didn't they deserve a present? It was clear that Nancy and Mrs. Walker both cared for him deeply. He wondered how he could be a good son to two adoring mothers. Danny's parents faced off with the Walkers and the Brokertons at the dinner table. Danny's mother Paulina sipped her wine. There are many women interested in marrying Danny. He's a catch. If you're going to nitpick the amount, then I'll give Danny and Selena more money. If they love each other, then what's done is done. I just hope my son doesn't regret marrying in haste. Selena frowned. She didn't know how to win her future mother-in-law over. Suddenly, there was a knock at the front door. A neighbor cried out, Andrew, a leader has come to your house. He says he's here to see someone named Robert. Open up. A leader? What leader? Andrew stood up from the table. He beckoned to his wife and they rushed to the door. Nancy and Robert followed them. When the Walkers and Brokertons left, Danny tugged on Paulina's sleeve. Mom, why are you being so rude? I know we're not rich either, but I thought you agreed to pay half the wedding cost. Two thousand dollars is chump change. How will I explain this to the Walker family? Paulina snorted. She was more than a little drunk. Silly child, what do you know? Look at their family's condition. The house is in shambles. It'll be a hindrance to our family. They can't even afford a car. Why should we subsidize their bad decisions? But, Danny wanted to argue, but his mother stopped him. But what? Believe me, I'm just trying to maximize your benefits. If Selena marries our family, the Walkers will be a burden. Danny, you could have had any woman you want. Why are you so dead set on marrying Selena? No matter what kind of family Selena came from, at least Selena was talented. She was educated, beautiful, and reasonable. Danny wrinkled his nose. Mom, if you want me to be happy, then you should pay the price. Son, you need to get your priorities straight. Paulina scoffed. Danny looked down in his lap. He was scared of defying his mother. Selena bit her thin red lips and didn't speak. Her eyes filled with tears. She didn't expect the Litchfields to hate her so much. Damon squeezed Selena's shoulder. Don't take it to heart. She doesn't mean to insult you. At that moment, a large group of people entered the house. Robert held Nancy's hand and chatted with a middle-aged man wearing glasses as they walked in. Who were these people? Gordon came out of the restroom, wiping his hands on his pants. He hadn't heard the conversation about money between Paulina and Danny. He sat next to his wife at the dining room table and raised his eyebrows when he saw the man talking to Robert. He nudged Paulina. Do you think that looks like Councilmember Brinkley? The one that used to work in Des Moines? It does look like him, Paulina answered. Councilmember Brinkley was on the executive committee. He helped Gordon's career before he transferred to upstate New York. What was he doing in the Walker family home? Gordon shook his head. I don't think it's the same person. It can't be. That would be too weird and random. A minute later, Councilmember Brinkley sat at the table. Gordon's eyes widened. It was him. Gordon hurried to greet him. Councilmember Brinkley, what brings you here? The council member was surprised to encounter Gordon and Paulina. He greeted them politely. Gordon, Paulina, it's nice to see you again. I heard that Robert and Nancy Brokerton were in town, so I came to wish them a happy holiday season. Unfortunately, I don't have much time to chat. Councilmember Brinkle turned to whisper something to one of his colleagues. Gordon was crestfallen. He sneaked a glance at the white-haired official Councilmember Brinkley was talking to. Gordon didn't recognize him, but he seemed to be at a higher level in status than Councilmember Brinkley. Gordon turned to Robert and quietly asked, Robert, who's the man with the white hair talking to the council member? Robert wiggled his eyebrows. 
you're not familiar with that man. He's Sylvester Bass, the mayor of Old Piney Fork. It's the next town over at the base of Mount Freedom. Gordon's jaw dropped. How did Robert and Nancy have friends in such high places? Robert treated these officials as equals. Sylvester turned to Robert and grinned. Robert, it's so rare that you're in the area. When are you going to let your former classmates know? I'd love to host you for a meal if you have time while you're in town. Robert laughed loudly. I'll take you up on that offer. I always host when you visit Los Angeles. It's about time you return the favor. Also, don't forget about the money you owe me. I expect payments on time with interest. Gordon and Paulina couldn't believe it. Though Robert was joking, ordinary people could never joke around about something like that with high-ranking government officials. Sylvester chortled and clapped Robert on the back. What do I owe you, a hundred bucks? That's pennies for a guy like you. I can't be bothered with it. I will, however, cook up something special and take you to a nice restaurant. I owe you that, at least. Robert smiled. I won't forget that hundred dollars, Sylvester. How do you think rich people stay rich? Ha! Sylvester chuckled so hard he almost was in tears. You haven't changed since college, Robert. You're still the same stingy, cheap bastard you always were. Nancy piped up from across the table. You men are talking nonsense. I prepared way too much food tonight. Can you all stay for a bit? Mrs. Walker clapped her hands gleefully. Yes, yes, we have plenty of food. Please eat while it's still hot. Sylvester quickly shook his head. No, 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 no. There are too many of us. You surely don't have enough to feed all of us. And it was impolite for us to drop in at dinner time. I was just passing by. That's why I rushed over to see Robert. You guys eat. I won't disturb you. But Robert, next time we meet, I want to have that drink. Robert nodded. You know, I could still drink you under the table, Sylvester. We're not in college anymore, but some things never change. Sylvester rose from the table and gestured to his colleagues to follow him. I truly apologize for barging in like this, and I'm even more sorry that we can't stay for a meal. It smells delicious, Nancy. Robert, make time in your schedule for me. Our secretaries will be in touch. When Sylvester, council member Brinkley, and the others left, Paulina and Gordon couldn't hide the shock on their faces. I guess that whiskey wasn't a cheap knockoff after all, Gordon whispered. Paulina coughed lightly. <coughs> well, that was exciting. Now where were we? Mrs. Walker gave Paulina a tight-lipped smile. We were discussing how we wanted to split the cost for Danny and Selena's wedding. You offer $2,000. Now that Paulina and Gordon knew that Selena was associated with powerful political players, their opinion of her increased. If their daughter-in-law had connections in the political world, it would mean a great deal of benefits for the Litchfield family. Paulina shook her head. Her change of heart was faster than flipping the page of a book. No, 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 I must have misspoken. I apologize for the confusion. I meant to say $20,000. She glanced at Gordon. My husband and I are willing to go up to 50, but that's the maximum we can take in loans from the bank. Selena is a great girl. This marriage is worth every penny, even if we have to take out a second mortgage. Isn't that right, dear? She prompted Gordon. Gordon swallowed his spoonful of mashed potatoes and nodded. That's correct, honey. He turned to Robert. Say, how do you know these fellows anyway? Robert chewed on a piece of broccoli. I thought you might have gathered that we went to university together. We're old friends. Paulina looked back and forth between Robert and Nancy. She knew from the moment she walked in the door that they weren't ordinary people. However, Nancy was wearing an apron and Robert had been chopping vegetables. Paulina ignored her gut feeling. Now she was kicking herself for the mistake. She was dying to know their backgrounds. When he thought of his boasting and arrogance, Gordon wanted to slap himself in the face. He wondered if he could spin this into an opportunity. From the conversation between Robert and Sylvester just now, it could be seen that Robert and Sylvester were close friends. Robert had a higher status than he originally thought. They hadn't been excited when their son told them he wanted to marry a working class girl from South Rivertown. Most parents hoped their children were married into a wealthier family than their own. Now they realize that Selena's parents might not be the richest people in town, but if Robert and Nancy were their close family friends, Selena would have access to wealth and resources beyond the Litchfield's wildest dreams. Thinking of this, Gordon raised his glass and said to Robert, I'd like to propose a toast to join families. Robert, this whiskey is indeed excellent. I was just messing with you earlier. I can tell it's real. Watch, I'll chug it in one gulp. Paulina also hurriedly said, If Selena wants to marry into our family, we'll happily serve her. Selena, if you don't feel comfortable living with us, we can help you with a down payment on your first apartment with Danny. How does that sound? Selena smiled shyly. That sounds wonderful. Thank you for your generosity, ma'am. Nancy, Robert, Mrs. Walker, Andrew, and Damon nodded politely at Gordon and Paulina. 
but they all suspected that the Litchfields only changed their minds about Selena due to Robert's connections. They lost respect for the Litchfields, though they still adored Danny. That night, Gordon and Paulina went to a hotel since Nancy and Robert were still in the guest room. Damon sat next to Selena on the couch. Selena, what do you think of Danny's parents? Damon asked. Selena sighed, a tear rolled down her cheek. I don't think I want to marry him anymore. Once the semester ends, I'll find an excuse to break up with him. Why? Although Damon had already guessed the answer, he was still quite surprised when she said it so firmly. Because I heard the way he interacts with his mother. He tried to stand up for me, but he was kind of wimpy about it. I don't want to sign up for a lifetime of trying to impress his mother, and I have a feeling he'll always take her side over mine. Danny wasn't the man she thought he was. It was better to extradite herself as delicately as possible before she got in too deep. But I thought you were in love with him. Damon remarked. Selena shrugged. Love isn't everything. I have to choose myself. I don't want to talk about it anymore. I'm going to go wash the dishes. She stood up and walked into the kitchen before Damon could reply. Looking at his sister's back, Damon sighed softly. He hoped his sister would find true happiness one day. Selena wasn't ready to tell her parents she wanted to break up with Danny. They continued with their scheduled activities as planned. The next day, Andrew and Mrs. Walker took the Litchfields to Mount Freedom. The tourist infrastructure was increased by leaps and bounds thanks to generous investments. Andrew and Mrs. Walker proudly told the Litchfields about Damon's business success. The Litchfields were impressed. They were even more excited about the union. Dollar signs danced in their eyes. The day before the Litchfields went back to Iowa, Selena couldn't take it anymore. She sent Danny a long text outlining how they weren't suitable for each other. She told him that though she cared about him, she needed him to be stronger. He was too weak to fight for her. If they were to marry, Selena's relationship with her mother-in-law would cause constant strife. She had to protect her heart. Danny tried to call Selena to beg her to take him back, but she immediately blocked his number. Danny was devastated. Gordon and Paulina were also disappointed. They looked forward to having a wealthy daughter-in-law. They had already fantasized about lavish gifts, expensive vacations, and family heirlooms Selena would receive. They couldn't let her go. If Danny could marry Selena, he wouldn't have to worry about money for the rest of his life. Gorn's career opportunities would advance, and Paulina would be the envy of all of her friends. Their hopes and dreams were dashed in an instant. That was why they impatiently called the Walkers to ask about the situation. In the face of Gordon and Paulina's inquiry, Mrs. Walker only said that the two children weren't compatible. The future was too vague and the distance between them was too far. Mrs. Walker supported whatever her daughter chose to do. No matter how Gordon and Paulina tried to salvage the situation, there was nothing they could do to fix it. Later on, Gordon and Paulina had a huge fight at home. They were talking about getting a divorce. Even Danny was unable to recover from the setback. Danny was angry at his parents. Everything had been going perfectly between him and Selena. Now, because of his mother's attitude, Selena dumped him like a hot potato. He didn't blame Selena for breaking up with him. His relationship with his mother would never be the same. The week passed quickly. Although Nancy and Robert were reluctant to part with the walkers, they still boarded a plane. They had to attend another business meeting in Europe. Now that things were finally settling down, Damon decided to visit Will Flagstaff's family. After all, before Will died, Damon promised to take care of Will's mother and sister. It was time to check on them. When Will died, he asked Damon to take care of his mother and sister. Although he wasn't in South Rivertown much these days, Damon still sent money to Will's family. Mrs. Flagstaff wrote to ask about Will's well-being, and Damon always said that Will was doing fine, but he didn't have cell phone service at his remote research location. Damon usually panicked when he had to make excuses for Will, but if they knew he was dead, their hearts would break. When he arrived at Will's house at noon, he could see Will's younger sister, Wendy, through the kitchen window. She was chopping vegetables and bobbing her head along to the music on her headphones. It had been a long time since Damon saw Wendy. She looked grown up and beautiful. Damon knocked on the door. I'm coming, Mrs. Flagstaff called out. The door opened. When Mrs. Flagstaff saw Damon, her eyes lit up. Oh, Damon, I'm so glad to see you. Please come in and make yourself at home. Damon sat on the couch. Mom, who's here? Wendy shouted from the kitchen. Mrs. Flagstaff smiled warmly at Damon. Sit tight, honey. I'll go to the kitchen and bring you some snacks. Wendy walked into the living room. Drying her hands on a dish towel, she took off her headphones and beamed at Damon. Oh my god, it's been ages. I can't believe you're here. Damon set a fruit basket on the table. Wendy eyed it before taking an apple. 
He didn't have to bring us anything. Of course I did. Damon replied. I promised your brother I looked out for you guys. Mrs. Flagstaff hurried back with a tray of cheese and crackers. Damon, what would you like to eat? I'll make you anything you want. Damon shook his head. That's very kind, but I'm not picky. Please don't worry about feeding me. Wendy poured Damon a cup of coffee and handed it to him. He smiled at her gratefully. Wendy, how have you been since I last saw you? Wendy ducked her head shyly. Pretty good. Our lives here have improved with your help. Our relatives don't bully us anymore, and the neighbors are polite and cordial. Also, those guys that you asked to protect us kept their word. Some guy tried to rob us a few months ago. Before he got his hands on our stuff, someone beat him black and blue in the front yard. Damon sipped his coffee. That's a relief. I'm glad to hear it. Only by taking good care of the mother and daughter pair would he be able to assuage the guilt in his heart. He made a mental note to take his reformed gangster friends out for drinks to thank them for protecting Wendy and Mrs. Flagstaff. How are you doing with your living expenses? Damon asked. Do you have enough money? Wendy nodded. With the money you deposited into my mom's bank account every month, we're living a pretty comfortable life. Now, are there any updates from Will? Has he written us a letter? Damon sighed. He'd already prepared his excuse. Sorry, Wendy, but there's been no word from him. He's now in Madagascar with limited internet connection, and the postal service is unreliable. I promise you he's working hard and he misses you very much. Wendy was disappointed, but she tried not to show it. Mrs. Flagstaff bustled back in. Okay, I whipped you up something quick from what I had in the fridge. Damon, I hope you don't mind leftovers for lunch. Wendy, help me set the table. As they ate, Mrs. Flagstaff also started to ask about Will. Damon repeated what he told Wendy. Then he prepared his story with details he made up on the spot. He said Will had dated a few women but broke their hearts. He also told them that Will was extremely busy with work, but he still got a chance to explore and go on adventures around the country. Mrs. Flagstaff and Wendy listened with great interest and giggled from time to time. Before they knew it, they finished lunch. Damon had planned to leave after the meal. The more he saw the joy in the mother and daughter, the more guilty Damon felt. He was reluctant to go back to his house. Unexpectedly, Wendy said, Damon, I'm struggling with my calculus homework. I heard that you aced your SATs. Can you help me study? Damon then remembered that Wendy had graduated high school, so she must be in college. Okay, where are you studying now? I'm at Meyerson University in my second year. Wendy replied proudly. Why did you apply to Meyerson? Damon asked as he thumbed through her textbook. Wendy blushed. You and my brother both went there. I want to follow in your footsteps. Mrs. Flagstaff clapped her hands. Yes, this is excellent. Damon, I would love it if you could tutor Wendy. I'm going to go play cards with some friends. Will you please stay for dinner after you finish helping Wendy? Damon shook his head. I'm sorry, but I have something to do tonight. However, I'm happy to look at Wendy's homework. Mrs. Flagstaff went out to see her friends. Wendy beckoned Damon toward her bedroom. Damon, come take a look at the calculus packet. It's on my desk. Damon was a little hesitant. He felt that it was inappropriate to enter Wendy's room. Wendy rolled her eyes. Don't worry, I won't bite. Anyway, all of my study materials are already set up in my room. There's no difference whether we study there or in the living room. That made sense to Damon. He followed Wendy into her room. Damon noticed that she hadn't changed the room much since she was a child, perhaps because she stayed at the dorms when she was at Meyerson. Dolls lined the shelves and a poster of a pop singer hung on the wall. The room had a refreshing fragrance, like a floral shampoo. Damon, what are you thinking about? Nothing. Damon came back to his senses and smiled. Wendy blushed. I need to redecorate, I know. She opened her school backpack and took out homework. I'm embarrassed to say that I failed the final, but my professor took pity on me and is allowing me to do a makeup test. I've always had good grades, but my field is humanities. Math has always been my weak spot. I hate that even humanities majors have to take required math classes to get credit toward our degree. Although Damon hadn't been in school for a while, he had a good memory, and he was an excellent teacher. He took complicated problems and simplified them as much as possible. Wendy's eyes shone brightly. Wow, I've never understood it this well. Damon opened the book and pointed to a practice problem for Wendy to try on her own. However, after a few minutes, he looked over and found that Wendy wasn't working on the problem. She was staring at him intently as if trying to peer into his soul. Damon frowned. Is something wrong? Do you have a question? Wendy's face turned red up to her hairline. She quickly shifted her gaze back to the textbook. It's nothing. It's just, well, you look so handsome when you're teaching. Do you have a girlfriend? Damon shifted uncomfortably in his seat. Wendy, that's none of your business. This isn't an appropriate discussion for us to have. Wendy stuck her chin out confidently. I'm not a child anymore, you know. 
Anyway, I've heard a bunch of stories about you from some of the seniors at Meyerson. Damon raised his eyebrows. Like what? Wendy giggled. I heard you dated a girl named Fifi, but then you guys had a public breakup. Also, someone told me that you used to host a radio broadcast with Veronica Matthew. People still miss those days. At the school radio station, they even have posters of you and Veronica to inspire current students. Damon furrowed his brow. How do you know all this? Wendy grinned. I joined the radio station last semester. I was fortunate enough to meet Veronica. She's amazing. She has to focus on her graduate program, but sometimes she comes back to do a guest broadcast. Oh, I just love when she plays the piano and sings. Damon rested his chin on his hand. Has she told you anything about me? Wendy nodded. Of course she has. She said you're a star basketball player. Wendy fiddled with a loose thread on the hem of her jeans. She also said that you're Ryan Gold. Damon sighed. Yeah, it's true. Wendy got up and rummaged in the top drawer of her dresser. She pulled out a handful of CDs. Damon was surprised to see them. Nowadays, everyone listened to music on their phones. CDs were a relic of the past. I have always been Ryan Gold's fan. I could sing a few of his songs. Look, I kept the CDs for when I was a teenager. Wendy sang a few bars of Time Flies. Her pitch was perfect. You have a lovely singing voice. Damon complimented her. Wendy smiled ear to ear after receiving Damon's praise. I also know that you founded Everbright, and you're the founder and CEO of Astromar. You're the most successful alumnus Myerson has. Gosh, it's like you know my whole life story, Damon exclaimed. Suddenly, Wendy's face became downcast. A single tear rolled down her cheek. Damon was concerned. Wendy, are you okay? What happened? Wendy wiped her tears and said, When I found out you were the boss of Astromar, I checked you out online. And she trailed off, sniffling through her tears. And then what? Damon gently prompted her. Wendy sighed. About what you said about my brother going to work in Madagascar. Well, I searched for his research team, but there's nothing about them online. It's like the research team doesn't exist. You told me he worked for Astromar, but Astromar doesn't have offices in Madagascar. Damon bit his lip. Well, it's top secret research team. Your brother has contributed a lot to the development of Astromar to its current scale. He just can't get in contact or talk about his work for the time being. Wendy sniffled. Damon, do you think I'm a fool? There aren't any flights from Meyerson to Madagascar. How long are you going to lie to me? My brother isn't in Africa. Damon, can you tell me the truth? Where is my brother? Damon tried hard to remain calm. Don't let your imagination run wild. Your brother is fine in Africa. If you want to see him, then I can ask him to come back. However, if he quits his job, then there will be no money left for you and your mother. Wendy instantly stopped crying. I'm willing to bear the consequences, and so is my mother. We just want to see Will and know that he's safe and sound. Damon was stunned. You miss your brother that much? Wendy nodded seriously. Damon, if my family is together again, I don't care if we slip back into poverty. I, um, I think I need to ask Will's opinion. Damon stammered. If he agrees, I'll transfer him back. Damon didn't expect Wendy to be so persistent. Wendy flopped on her bed and stared at her hands clasped in her lap. Damon, do you know how anxious my mom is? She dreams about Will every night. Sometimes she has nightmares that he's in trouble or that he died. I wake up and hear her screaming, and then I run in to comfort her and tell her that Will is fine. But I can't lie to myself anymore. She gazed at Damon. I just want to hear what you have to say. Tell me the truth. Is my brother still alive? Don't worry. From the moment I searched for those things, I already made up my mind that he was dead. I've begun to process my grief. I can accept the worst outcome, and I'll also hide it from my mother. I can handle it. I just want to be treated like an adult. For a moment, Damon's mind was in chaos. He didn't know how to continue. He didn't want Wendy to know about Will's death. Damon was silent. Wendy got her answer. Her tears flowed like a waterfall. She wept with no sound. Although she had thought this resolve a thousand times, nothing compared to having her suspicions confirmed. How did he die? Wendy whispered. Damon sighed. Wendy, your brother was a good man. His death was complicated and I'll explain everything to you later. No matter what happens, I guarantee you that you and your mother won't have to worry about money again for the rest of your lives. Your brother also prepared a large sum of money for you before he died. He wanted to allocate it to you every month, but if you need it, I'll also give it to you in one go. And I'll also be responsible for your future. Thank you, Damon. Thank you for telling me the truth. I'm grateful. She leaned her head on Damon's shoulder and cried into his jacket. He patted Wendy's back and comforted her. If you need a brother figure, you can always come to me. Wendy sniffled. That's kind of you, but uh, forget it. I don't want you to be my brother. 
I only have one brother in my life. After a long time, Wendy let go of Damon. Damon was surprised. He didn't expect Wendy to reject him, but soon Damon realized that something was wrong. He saw Wendy looking at him with bright eyes. Oh my god, Damon thought, she has a crush on me. Damon realized that she had a crush on him. He looked at his watch. Wendy, it's getting late. If you understand the calculus problems, I'll go back now. Are you going to leave? A flash of disappointment appeared in Wendy's eyes. Can't you leave after dinner? She widened her eyes, pleading with him. Damon sighed. Okay, fine, I'll stay for dinner. In an instant, Wendy's tears broke into a smile. Damon, thank you. Then what dishes do you like to eat? I'll make you anything you want tonight. The food we had for lunch was delicious. Damon replied, We can have leftovers. I don't want you to go into any trouble. Wendy shook her head. You did me a great kindness this afternoon, Damon. Please allow me to repay you. At that moment, Wendy's mother returned home. When she saw that Damon was still there, she couldn't stop smiling. During dinner, Mrs. Flagstaff started to mutter about Will again. She wanted Damon to pass on a message to her son. Damon hurriedly nodded his head and agreed. Wendy ate gloomily, not wanting to tell her mother the truth about Will. They finished eating. The sky turned dark. Mrs. Flagstaff said, Wendy, please see Damon out. Outside, the lanterns had just been lit. The two of them quietly walked into the alley without saying anything. Wendy leaned against Damon. He didn't move away. I'm a little scared of the dark, Wendy said softly. Damon held her hand. Wendy relaxed. Damon, can you come and see me often? Now Wendy knew the truth about Will's death. Damon still felt an immense guilt in his heart, and he didn't want to upset her more. He nodded. All right, I promise you. Then you must keep your promise. In a few days, I'll be going back to school. Can you come see me on campus once a month? Damon agreed. He couldn't let Will down. Oh, Damon, thank you. Wendy smiled, but when she thought of her brother, sadness welled up in her heart. Wendy, this matter with your mother. Damon trailed off. Wendy understood Damon's concerns and tried to squeeze out a smile. Don't worry, Damon. I'll keep the secret forever. I'll never let my mother know. After saying goodbye to Wendy, Damon returned home. The next morning, Damon called Frank again. He wanted to ask if Mayor Francis was at home and if he could come over for lunch. Frank seemed happy that Damon took the initiative to call him. Mayor Francis happened to be at home, so they agreed to have lunch together at noon. Damon brought holiday gifts to the Francis family. He found that other than Mayor Bob Francis and his wife, Frank and Grandfather Mac were also there, but he didn't see Emily. Frank noticed Damon's surprise and said, That girl's been busy with blind dates recently. She went out with some random guy today and still hasn't come back. Frank didn't like Emily's blind dates, so he didn't speak politely. Damon nodded and didn't ask any more questions. After Emily graduated, she went to graduate school to pursue a master's degree, but Damon didn't know which school she was attending. He supposed it was normal for her to date at her new school. Mayor Francis and his wife were excited to see Damon. Frank and Emily had told their parents that Damon was a brokerton and that there were many twists and turns in the story. Damon's sudden identity caught Mayor Francis and his wife by surprise. Although the two families had different ideologies, it didn't prevent them from admiring each other in their respective fields. Grandfather Mac and Grandpa Everett were old acquaintances. Mac was enthusiastic to talk about Damon, about his biological grandfather. Damon also had another important goal, which was to discuss the complicated financial situation with the Francis family. Damon was close to the Francis family, and there were some things that the Brokerton family couldn't say, but Damon could. Grandfather Mac still remembered the last financial storm. The final result was bleak. Ordinary citizens suffered heavy losses. Thinking back about it now, it was still fresh in his mind. He couldn't let the tragedy of history repeat itself. After the meal, Mayor Francis and Grandfather Mac dragged Damon to the study to chat for a long time. They asked about the financial turmoil and offered assistance to Damon if Astamar ran into any roadblocks. When Damon was about to leave, he saw Emily coming back. She was holding hands with a man. The man spotted a ponytail and looked like an artist, but he drove a Lamborghini. When Emily saw Damon, her eyes lit up. When did you arrive? I just had lunch with your family. Damon replied, I've been here for a few hours. The man narrowed his eyes. Emily, who is this? He's just a friend, said Emily. Damon, this is my new boyfriend, Diego. Isn't he handsome? Quite handsome. Damon nodded and smiled. Congratulations. Remember to invite me to your wedding. Emily rolled her eyes at Damon. Depends on my mood. She said goodbye to her new boyfriend as he walked out to the car. At this time, Damon also wanted to leave, but Emily stopped him. 
Why are you leaving as soon as I get here? I have things to do. Damon answered honestly. All right, then. Emily looked coldly at Damon. She slammed the door behind him. Diego leaned against his Lamborghini and smoked. He seemed to be waiting for something. When he saw Damon walk out, Diego casually waved his finger at Damon. You, come here. Damon frowned. What's the matter? Where are you from? Diego asked. Damon crossed his arms. Why do you want to know? Diego was shocked. He didn't expect Damon to use such a tone to speak to him. His eyes flashed with anger. Do you know who I am? How dare you speak to me like that? Damon lit a cigarette. I don't care who you are. I'm warning you. If you hurt Emily, I'll break your legs. She's a good woman. Diego snarled at Damon. I advise you stay away from Emily. Get lost, Damon growled. Diego was frightened by Damon's domineering tone. He wanted to scare Damon, but he was too intimidated. This isn't over, Diego hissed. He extinguished his cigarette, got into his sports car, and drove off into the sunset. A week later, Damon and Selena bid farewell to Mrs. Walker and Andrew. They boarded the flight back to Meyerson and started working and studying. Before Damon could return to his normal work, he received a handwritten letter from Avery. It smelled like her perfume. At first, Damon was excited. However, when he read the contents of the letter, his heart went cold. Dear Damon, I've wanted to write this letter for a long time, but I didn't know how to express myself. I know you're seeing Fifi behind my back. When I heard the news, my heart ached. I thought of the past. How do we get to this point? Do you remember the days and nights we spent in the Northern Europe and on Mount Freedom? Do you remember the promises we made to each other? We were supposed to get married. I see now that everything was a lie. You betrayed me. Don't bother me anymore. I wish you luck and happiness in your future endeavors. I'll find someone better than you who will treat me with the respect I deserve. I hope I never see you again. Have fun with Fifi or Veronica or whomever you'd like. We're done. Sincerely, Avery. Damon could see tear stains on the paper. He sat down and read the letter over again. He knew she would find out sooner or later, but he hoped this day would never come. He should have realized something was wrong when Avery didn't come home for the holidays. He wondered how she found out. He wanted to contact her, but he thought better of it and decided not to. Her message was loud and clear. Damon had finally lost Avery. Damon felt dizzy. It was one thing for her to know about Fifi, but why had she mentioned Veronica? He lit a cigarette, but it didn't help. He couldn't believe it was over between him and Avery. The pain was unbearable. He returned to Nancy and Robert's Meyerson home. Only Vicky was there. Damon went upstairs and was about to lie down in his bed when he heard a knock on the door. Damon didn't get up. The knocking didn't stop. It got louder and more forceful. Damon couldn't take it anymore and stood up to open the door. Sure enough, he saw Vicky with her arms crossed over her chest. You didn't say hi to me when you got back. Damon frowned. I'm tired. I just want to go to sleep. Vicky didn't let him off so easily. What's wrong? You were in such high spirits when you left, and now you seem listless and moody. Did something happen? Damon's face darkened. Are you quite finished? Nope. Vicky pushed past him and walked into his room. I bet you got into an argument with Avery. Did you guys finally part ways? Damon raised his eyebrows. How did you know? Vicky gave him a knowing look. Just a lucky guess. What else would make you frown so deeply? Be careful, you'll get wrinkles. Damon glared at Vicky. Okay, out with it, speak. Did you say something to Avery? Vicky frowned. I told you, it was just a guess. Are you crazy? Why would I contact Avery? Damon didn't believe her. If it wasn't you, who could have it been? Vicky pouted. Damon, you jerk. I knew about your infidelity, but so does Veronica. Even Fifi could have told Avery. Why do you suspect me and not them? Damon shook his head. I suspect you because you've been threatening me for months, Vicky. You tried to blackmail me. You're the only one who has a motive to reveal my secrets. Vicky started to cry. I know I threatened you, but it's just because I'm in love with you. I'm not a fool. I knew you'd be angry if I told Avery, and I don't want you to abandon me. I've been having fun toying with you. If I told Avery, then I'd have no more bargaining chips. I can never get you to fall in love with me. Then you'd leave me for Fifi or Veronica. Tears streamed down her face. Against his better judgment, Damon pitied her. The more he thought about it, the more he realized Vicky was right. It wouldn't do her any good to tell Avery these things. She wouldn't benefit from it. Damon couldn't rule out the possibility that Fifi or Veronica had told Avery. He shouldn't be biased against Vicky due to their past grudges. When he thought of this, Damon's heart was filled with guilt. He also didn't know how much harm he'd done to Vicky. 
He reached over and wiped her tears. I'm sorry, Vicky. I reacted without thinking. Vicky cried harder and batted his hand away. Damon, you're such an idiot. Do you know how much I love you? You'll never know. Ever since you saved me on the plane, I've thought about you day and night. My love for you grew, but you only saw me as a family friend. I'm terrified that I'll lose you. Damon was stunned. I didn't think your feelings for me were that strong. I thought you were just messing around. Vicky sniffled. That's because you can't see what's right in front of your big dumb face. You treat me like trash. You mock me and criticize me. I might look like I'm holding on, but do you know how sad I am? Every time you reject me, my heart feels like it's been stabbed a thousand tiny needles. I'll never forgive you. Vicky ran out of the room, her hands over her face. Damon stood up. Vicky, where are you going? None of your business, Vicky screamed. You don't like me at all. Why do you care where I'm going? Go find Avery, Veronica, and Fifi. She ran downstairs, then out the house, violently slamming the doors behind her. Damon was concerned. It was dark outside. Though there were security guards in the neighborhood, there were still plenty of places of evil people to lurk in the shadows. If Vicky encountered anyone dangerous, Damon would never forgive himself. Damon grabbed his jacket and chased after her. Vicky was a fast runner. She was already at the end of the road. When she saw Damon chasing her, she rolled around in a different direction, headed toward the lake. From afar, he heard a distant splashing sound. Had Vicky jumped in the lake? She could drown. Damon was so scared that he broke out into a cold sweat. He rushed to the lake fast as a bolt of lightning, but he saw that other than a wave of ripples, there was nothing on the surface of the water. Damon jumped into the lake without thinking. Vicky, Vicky, where are you? He cried. You must be joking. I believe you. I know it wasn't you who did it. As long as you come out, I will never doubt you again. I'll do anything. Please don't make a stupid mistake. There was no response. Damon swam back and forth in the cold lake, searching for Vicky. Just as Damon was about to lose all hope, he heard a shout. Damon, come out. I'm on the shore. Damon emerged from the dark water. Vicky was sitting on the shore, rocking back and forth and hugging her knees. Damon sprinted over to her. He was soaking wet. Vicky, I... I thought you were dead. Damon emerged from the lake. He thought Vicky had drowned herself. He was relieved to see her safe and sound on the shore. Vicky stomped her foot. You idiot! I didn't jump into the lake. I was standing here perfectly fine. You put yourself in danger. You must be freezing. Damon exhaled slowly. I'm so glad you're okay, Vicky. You scared me to death just now. Vicky removed her jacket and handed it to Damon so he could warm up, but Damon rejected it. Please don't. I'm not that cold. Just don't do anything like this ever again, okay? I don't want to worry about you. Vicky nodded. I promise it'll never happen again. When Vicky ran to the lake ahead of Damon, she wanted to test his loyalty, so she picked up a large stone and threw it into the water. Then she hid to see how Damon would react. To her surprise, Damon had jumped into the lake, disregarding his safety, and swam back and forth to find her. Vicky couldn't take it anymore, and she didn't want him to freeze to death, so she came out of her hiding place and called him. Please just take my jacket. Vicky pleaded with him. It'll make me feel better. You're soaked to the bone. Damon begrudgingly accepted the jacket and wrapped it around his shoulders. Vicky bit her lip. Was it true what you said when you were searching for me in the lake? Damon rubbed his hands together to keep warm. What part? What did I say? Vicky gazed at him. You said that as long as I was alive, you will never doubt me again. You said he'd do anything. Damon frowned. Yeah, I suppose I did say that. Vicky's eyes lit up. Then you'll keep your promise? Damon nodded. Vicky's heart surged with warmth. Oh, Damon, I knew it. You love me, don't you? Please answer me honestly. I, um, I like you. Damon stammered. He didn't say he loved her. Love was a bigger commitment. But he couldn't hide that he'd developed feelings for her. Vicky was beautiful. Any man would like her, and Damon knew her love for him was sincere. She had given her heart and soul to him. Although she didn't get the answer she wanted the most, Vicky's heart melted again when she heard Damon say he liked her. She stood on her tiptoes and kissed Damon's lips. That's enough for me right now. I can live with that answer. Now I can die happy. Damon pulled away. Don't speak nonsense about death. Vicky shook her head. I'm not talking nonsense. You will never know how much I love you. Everything I have done for you was just to wait for this sentence. As long as you like me, I'll be satisfied. I don't ask for much. I can even be cordial with Avery, Fifi, and Veronica. I don't even need the title of girlfriend or wife. Just knowing the truth is enough for me. 
Damon's heart raced. Vicky's love knew no bounds. She put down her pride and chose compassion. However, Damon was scared of the future. This revelation would irrevocably change their relationship. They held hands and returned home. Vicky immediately went to the kitchen to brew a pot of coffee so Damon could recover from the chill. Thank you, Vicky. Damon said sincerely. Vicky looked at him with concern. I just don't want you to catch a cold. You look upset. Damon was quiet. Vicky poured him a mug of coffee. Is there something on your mind? Is it because Avery broke up with you? I know that was a heavy blow. Damon smiled sadly. It's okay. I'm hurt, but I'll get over it. I knew it would happen eventually. Vicky sat next to him on the sofa. She was one of your childhood sweethearts. It might take some time for you to get over her. Yeah, I've known her for a long time. Damon replied. Vicky lowered her head. I have known you for longer, technically speaking. We were born in the same hospital. Before you were separated from the Brokertons, we played together when our families visited. We had a lot of fun. I mean, I don't remember it much because I was so young, but my mother and Nancy always talked about how well we got along. Damon sipped his coffee. If you don't remember it well, then does it count? Vicky crossed her arms. Sometimes I think Faye is teasing me. If the earthquake never happened and you and I could have grown up together and fallen in love as adults, we could have had a love story for the ages. Damon sighed. Vicky, it's useless to ruminate on the past. What's done is done. You can't turn back the hands of time no matter how much you want to. Vicky poured herself some coffee. I guess that's true. By the way, when I was chatting with Veronica, I heard you confess to Avery when you graduated from high school. It was a pity that you failed, right? Damon widened his eyes. Veronica told you about that? That's right. As I said, Veronica and I are allies. She told me everything she knew about your past. Vicky reached for the cream and sugar and dumped a hefty amount in her coffee. It was brave how you jumped into the river and saved Veronica. That's why I wanted to see if you would do the same for me. You're very brave, Damon. No wonder Veronica still can't let go of you. You put your life on the line to save people. It's an attractive quality. You saved me on the plane even though you didn't like me at the time. Every woman wants a hero. Damon thought about Vicky's words. He'd indeed saved many people. He even saved Vicky's former roommate Gwen when she was harassed by a group of hooligans at Myerson University. He wondered if Gwen also had feelings for him. He quickly pushed the thought out of his mind. That would be ridiculous. He was the object of jealousy and scorn in Gwen's heart. She'd been competing with him in the business world ever since. Hello, Earth Damon. Vicky pretended to knock on Damon's skull. He came back to his senses. Sorry, I was lost in thought. Vicky rolled her eyes. You're always brooding. Look, Damon, Veronica told me many things about you. She even told me that you secretly kissed Avery when you were traveling in Europe. Why haven't you ever traveled to Europe with me? We can invite Veronica. I don't mind sharing. That seems awkward. Damon replied. So I guess that's a no. Vicky pouted. You need to be smart about your current situation, Damon. You know that Veronica and I both like you. Maybe the three of us could have a little fun if you know what I mean. Think about it. This type of opportunity doesn't fall into a man's lap every day. Damon blushed. He'd long fantasized about the situation Vicky alluded to, but on the surface, he still had to put on an act. I haven't the foggiest idea of what you can mean. Vicky threw back her head and laughed. Tuh, I know the pervy thoughts that go on through your brain. Don't be coy with me, Damon. Damon set down his coffee cup and rose from the sofa. I'm going to bed, Vicky. Thanks again for the coffee. Vicky smirked at him as he left the living room. Though she hadn't gotten exactly what she wanted, she knew she was one step closer. Damon woke up early in the next morning. He heard voices downstairs. He washed his face and brushed his teeth. Then he padded down the stairs in his slippers to see who was talking. Vicky and Veronica were chatting and giggling in the dining room, their heads close together. Damon hadn't seen Veronica for a long time. Things hadn't ended well the last time they met. Each time he tried to contact her, she coldly brushed him off and was not nearly as enthusiastic as before. Though Vicky kept saying that Veronica still cared about him, it was only Vicky's side of the story. Who could tell whether it was true or false? Veronica was just as beautiful as ever. Damon tried to calm his heart and keep his tone casual. Hey, Veronica, I'm surprised to see you here. Hello, Damon, Veronica said quietly. Vicky looked back and forth between Damon and Veronica, then stood up from the table. Damon, I made some breakfast. It's in the kitchen if you're hungry. Damon wanted to say a few words to Veronica, but he saw that Veronica was only focusing on conversing with Vicky and didn't intend to talk to him. 
Damon took a few pieces of toast and went to the balcony. He thought of Avery again. Their relationship played like a movie in his mind. He wished her the happiness she deserved. He would never stop feeling guilty for how he handled the relationship. Damon had been playing with fire since the beginning. He wondered how everything would pan out. Would he have children and build a family with Fifi? Would he hook up with Veronica and Vicky in Europe? Would they all realize how deceptive Damon was and leave him? Regardless of what happened, he could never return to normal friendship with any of the women. Thinking of this, Damon was suddenly in the mood to drink. He looked around to ensure no one was watching him. Then he fruitively dumped an airplane mini-bottle whiskey into his coffee. He remembered when Fifi and he broke up. Damon got wasted with his friends back then, comforted by their support and camaraderie. How did he get to the point of drinking alone in the morning? When he finished the airplane mini-bottle, he went to his secret stash behind the potted plants. He was relieved to find almost the entire bottle of whiskey waiting for him. He dumped it into his coffee and mug, not bothering to refill the coffee in his cup. The scent of roses wafted into his nostrils. He'd know that perfume anywhere. A faint voice behind him spoke. Why did you start drinking? Damon turned around and saw Veronica. Although her tone was calm, it didn't hide her concern. Damon sighed. Whether or not Veronica truly loved him in the past, Veronica would still leave him in the end. He didn't need to impress her anymore. I was thirsty. He replied indifferently. Veronica frowned. She snatched the whiskey bottle from him. What the hell are you thinking, drinking whiskey in the morning? You're headed to an early grave. Give that back, Damon growled. Veronica raised her eyebrows. She didn't think Damon would be so fierce, and his expression scared her. She gave him the whiskey bottle. He grabbed it from her outstretched hand and chugged the amber liquid straight from the bottle. Veronica started to cry quietly. What's wrong? Damon asked. Veronica shook her head. Nothing. She wiped her tears with the sleeve of her sweatshirt. She wanted to put on a brave face in front of Damon, but she couldn't be strong anymore. She wondered if he would stop drinking if Avery or Fifi told him to. Damon's face softened. I'm sorry. I was gruff with you a moment ago. I didn't mean to scare you. I'll just finish this cup and after that, I won't drink anymore. Go inside and do your thing. I'll see you in a little while. Veronica sniffled. Damon, what did Avery say to you? Not much, Damon said. It was just a breakup letter. I knew that this day would come because it was all my fault. I just can't believe it's finally over between us. Veronica gazed up at him, her eyes wide. That's it? Damon set down his cup on the ledge of the balcony. She said she would find a man who truly loved her, someone much better than me. She felt like she already has. I should give her my blessing, right? Veronica bit her lip. It sounds like you can't let go of her because you're jealous that she might have another boyfriend. Damon shrugged. Maybe so. I can admit it. I have nothing to hide anymore. Veronica looked over at the garden. She might have other secrets. A while back, she called me and asked me to take a good care of you. Her tone was strange. I told her it's not my responsibility to take care of you. Damon didn't know what to say. He gulped down the rest of the whiskey, then hiccuped. Veronica shot him a nervous glance. You've hardly had any breakfast. You're going to hurt yourself if you drink on an empty stomach like that. Vicky and I bought a lot of food at the grocery store this morning. You can eat whatever you want from the fridge. I'm sure Vicky wouldn't mind preparing something for you to eat. She likes to cook and she's worried about you. Damon looked at Veronica out of the corner of his eye. What about you? Don't you worry about me? Veronica didn't look him in the eye. Of course I do, she mumbled. Damon's heart surged with tenderness. Though he had known Avery longer... He had more experiences with Veronica. Since he'd read her diary, he felt he knew Veronica more intimately than any other woman. Veronica left for a moment, then came back with a glass of ice water. Here, drink some water and get hydrated before you eat. Thank you. Damon took it. He didn't realize how dehydrated he'd been. He drank it all in one gulp and wiped his mouth with the back of his hand. Veronica looked at him shyly. Damon, there's a party at the Meyerson University Music Hall tonight. I heard there will be music and dancing. Do you want to go? I hate to think you'd be sitting here by yourself and drinking alone all day. Damon wrinkled his nose. I'm not a good dancer. Veronica furrowed her brow. That's not the point. I just think it would be good for you to get out of the house. Treat this as a distraction. Damon reluctantly agreed. He had to admit that he was excited about going somewhere with Veronica. It was time for lunch. Vicky called them inside and presented them with the delicious feast of pecan chicken salad creamy vegetable soup, and garlic bread. After they ate, Veronica invited them to go shopping. 
Initially, Damon didn't want to go, but Veronica and Vicky were worried that if Damon was alone at home, something bad would happen. They forcefully dragged Damon along. At the mall, the two women had fun choosing outfits for Damon to try on. Veronica wanted him to wear something nice to the event that evening. Damon was still a little tipsy, but he went along with it as not spoil their excitement. What kind of party is it tonight anyway? I didn't think it was fancy. Damon remarked. Veronica hesitated for a moment, then told him the real story. The College of Music at Meyerson University was holding a grand party that night to celebrate the famous alumni. Damon's friend Levi was one of the people being honored. They hosted a special concert, hoping to promote their music school and attract new talent. Meyerson invited many celebrities and big shots from around the country to help out. Veronica received an invitation to perform. Though she wasn't a student at the College of Music and she wasn't famous in the music industry, she had an extraordinary musical talent. If she wanted to become famous, all she had to do was sign with an entertainment agency, but she had other goals and plans for her life. However, she still agreed to give a guest performance. She planned to sing Time Flies on stage and hoped Damon would join her for a duet. That was the real reason she'd invited him to accompany her to the event. Damon didn't object to Veronica's request. He missed the days when he was broadcasting with Veronica on the radio station. Those were some of the best memories of his youth. Veronica and Vicky took Damon shopping for a new outfit to wear to the party. When Damon emerged from the fitting room, the sales clerk fawned over him. Damon was a handsome man, but he looked like a Greek god sculpted from marble when he wore a perfectly tailored suit. Veronica and Vicky had known Damon for a long time, but they'd never seen him look more attractive. They both gazed at him shyly and praised his appearance. Then they asked the sales clerks to wrap up the suit. They return home, their arms laden with shopping bags. Vicky had purchased many accessories for Damon while he wasn't paying attention, and Veronica had bought herself a dress to wear to the party that would complement Damon's suit. Vicky pulled Damon aside while Veronica was busy in the kitchen. Damon, you're not allowed to flirt with anyone tonight, she said seriously. Damon frowned. Why not? You can't deprive me of my freedom. Veronica wandered back into the room. What are you guys talking about? Vicky crossed her arms. Veronica, since we're allies, I'll be honest with you. I'm concerned that the women at the party tonight will flirt with Damon when they see him wearing the suit we bought for him. Can you keep an eye on him and make sure he doesn't do anything stupid? Veronica nodded. I support that. Damon's jaw dropped. It was one thing for Vicky to attempt to control him, but it was another thing entirely that Veronica was on Vicky's side. Maybe he didn't know her as well as he thought. They went out on the patio to eat an early dinner. Veronica talked and laughed with Vicky. They had become good friends as they teamed up to share Damon's affection, though Damon knew it was a strange situation. Part of him also fantasized that the three of them could coexist harmoniously. Wouldn't that make everyone happy? Veronica smiled at Vicky. Hey, I have an extra ticket to the party tonight. You're welcome to come if you don't have any other plans. Vicky shook her head. Thanks for the invitation, but I'm going out tonight with some friends. Vicky was jealous that Veronica and Damon were going out together, but she also thought it wasn't a bad idea for Damon to distract himself from his breakup with Avery. Furthermore, she trusted Veronica to keep other women away from Damon. Damon drove the Tesla to Meyerson University. The dinnertime radio broadcast echoed across campus. The two radio hosts sang duets and bantered. It wasn't as enchanting as when Damon and Veronica hosted the broadcast, but the two juniors were still talented. Damon turned to look at Veronica and was surprised to discover she was already staring at him. Veronica blushed and quickly shifted her gaze to stare out the window. Damon sighed. He wished he could go back to the days when they hosted the radio show together. Everything felt so much simpler. He parked the car. Veronica, I heard from a friend that you returned to the radio station to guest host a couple of shows. I thought it was interesting. You're a graduate student in a demanding program. Why did you add another extracurricular to your plate? Veronica was stunned. She didn't expect Damon to know she went back to the radio station. Well, they practically begged me. I have good memories of my time at the broadcasting station, so I thought it wouldn't be too bad to host a few shows. Who's your co-host? Damon casually asked. Veronica combed her hair with her fingers and looked into the rearview mirror. I'm not with anyone. Sometimes I'm with Jordan. Damon's face fell. Co-hosting the radio show required a certain intimacy and chemistry between the host in question. Everyone knew that Jordan liked Veronica. Damon was envious that they had a chance to spend quality time together. Why are you hosting with Jordan? I didn't think he was a good performer. Damon's mood was sour. Veronica sighed. Damon, you know that he used to read the announcements over the loudspeaker in high school, right? He's always wanted to be on the radio station. Damon scowled. 
It seems pretty convenient that he waited until you didn't have a co-host to suddenly swoop in and ask to broadcast with you. I hope he didn't pressure you. Veronica shook her head. Not at all. I don't feel pressured. He's not a bad co-host. Damon was annoyed. He wanted Veronica to say that Jordan was a terrible broadcasting partner, but she complimented his skills instead. Veronica noticed Damon's mood. He looked like he wanted to get angry, but he had nowhere to go. She decided to stroke his ego. I said he wasn't a bad co-host. I didn't say he was better than you. He's much worse. Damon swelled with pride. Is that so? Veronica nodded. If you don't like me co-hosting the show with Jordan, I won't invite him back. No, 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 no. Damon hurried to say. I don't want to control you. I'll get over myself. Veronica arched an eyebrow. So you wouldn't mind if I invite him to be a regular fixture on my broadcast? Damon was conflicted. Veronica, I... I just don't think he's a good person. That's all. He doesn't have innocent intentions with you. Veronica laughed. Well, then what about you? Do you want to come back and co-host the show with me instead? That way, we don't have to call Jordan. Damon shook his head. Forget it. I'm too busy. Veronica widened her eyes. What are you busy with? She still didn't know that Damon was the founder of Astromar. I'm busy with my career. Damon replied. They chatted as they went to the school's auditorium. They were half an hour early to the party, but the doors were already open. People began to mingle as the staff finished setting up the food and the decorations. Why don't we go for a walk? Veronica suggested. We don't want to be some of the first people inside. It's always better to be fashionably late. Damon nodded. That's a great idea. There are still a few minutes before the sun sets. They strolled past the basketball court. When the basketball players saw Veronica in her gorgeous evening gown, they puffed out their chest and played more aggressively, wanting to impress her. Veronica usually had that effect on men. She rolled her eyes, both embarrassed and flattered by the attention. Damon thought that Veronica was watching the team play basketball. Little did he know that Veronica's thoughts had already drifted far away. She remembered when she found out that Damon went to Meyerson and hadn't told her about it. She'd walked by the same basketball court just in time to see Damon making a slam dunk. At first, she thought she was hallucinating. Why would Damon be on campus without telling her? Their relationship had been ambiguous back then, but Veronica still felt wrong that Damon hadn't bothered to mention his admittance to Meyerson. What are you thinking about? Damon noticed that Veronica was silent. Veronica glanced at him out of the corner of her eye. Nothing. I was just remembering my freshman year of college. They continued walking. Veronica turned around and asked, Damon, do you remember when you invented a lame excuse so I wouldn't go out with Drew? You said you had to borrow a textbook and it was an emergency. Of course, Damon remembered that night vividly. He had said he was missing some pages from his textbook and needed to borrow Veronica's so he could study for a test. Veronica didn't know it, but Damon had saved her from getting drugged at the party with Drew. Damon didn't realize that Veronica was already in love with him back then. Though Drew showered her with gifts and affection, Veronica always ignored him. However, she proudly wore the cheap watch Damon gave her as if it was the most precious gift she'd ever received. Damon felt awkward. Veronica wanted to laugh when she saw Damon's facial expression. She was still wearing the cheap watch even though she wore an evening gown. Damon didn't notice. They approached the bench by the pond. They sat there and talked before Veronica went to Berlin to study abroad. Do you still remember this place? Veronica asked. Damon looked around and nodded. Yeah, this is where you said you were in a dilemma about moving to Germany, but you lacked a good reason to stay in the United States. Veronica pursed her lips. You have a good memory. What were your thoughts at the time? Damon tapped his index finger on his chin. I was stupid. I didn't know what you meant. After he read her diary, he realized Veronica wanted him to beg her to stay. Fortunately, the universe gave Damon another chance. Although he missed Veronica at the time, fortunately she returned. Damon smiled. I didn't know what you were thinking. I didn't want you to go, but I also didn't want to make you uncomfortable. I wanted to confess my feelings to you right then and there, but I was afraid that if you didn't feel the same way, you'd leave my life forever, and we wouldn't even remain friends. Really? Veronica looked up and saw Damon's facial expression was sincere. She never imagined that Damon would like her so much. If she had chosen not to go to Germany, there wouldn't have been so many obstacles between her and Damon. Fifi, Avery, and Vicky wouldn't be in the picture, and she and Damon could have been together. However, life was unpredictable. She didn't have a time machine. All she could do was move forward with the life she was given. What if I ask you the same question now? Veronica fluttered her eyelashes at him. What would you say? Damon gazed at her, tenderness in his eyes. I would tell you to stay. I might even beg you not to go to Berlin. The answer she was waiting for for three years too late. Still, Veronica blossomed like a flower. 
Huh? You're still wearing that watch? It's the same one I gave you, right? Damon reached down and touched Veronica's wrist. Veronica ducked her head and nodded shyly. She'd taken good care of the watch over the years. It looked good as new. Wow, I'm surprised. Damon remarked. It wasn't expensive. Aren't you embarrassed to be seen pairing a cheap watch with a designer evening gown tonight? I can't believe it hasn't broken. Veronica shook her head. Damon didn't know how much the watch meant to her. It was the first birthday present Damon gave her. Nothing could replace it in Veronica's heart. However, Veronica was shy by nature. She would never say these words out loud. Damon chuckled. A woman like you deserves a better watch. Let me buy you another one. I can afford it now. Veronica covered the watch protectively with her other hand. Thank you very much for the offer, but I'm quite partial to this watch. It might not cost much money, but it has great sentimental value. Damon raised his eyebrows. I know this watch has special meaning to you, but you shouldn't have to wear a piece of junk. I didn't have the money to buy you something nicer back then, so now I want to make it up to you. Otherwise, in the future, when you wear this kind of watch, people might get judgmental. Veronica's face turned red. What nonsense are you talking about? I'm not your girlfriend. Damon bent down and grabbed her hand, gently stroking his palm. Let's go. It's almost time for the party. They walked back to the auditorium and saw a large crowd outside. Not all of them were party guests. Word had gotten out that celebrities would attend the party, so fans rushed over to catch a glimpse of the famous faces. The crowd cheered when Levi arrived. Men and women ran forward, reaching out to grab Levi's clothes. Their screams reverberated through the courtyard outside the auditorium. Levi, I love you. You're my idol. Levi, can I have your autograph? Levi, let me have your babies. Since Levi was surrounded by fans, Damon only gave him a distant wave. Veronica smiled. Damon, what do you think would happen if I shouted that Ryan Gold is here? Damon's eyes widened. No way, don't do it. When did you become so naughty? Veronica giggled and stuck out her tongue playfully, but she didn't reveal his identity to the throng of adoring fans. Damon scanned the crowd and noticed many familiar faces, including Gwen and Riley. Damon wondered if Xander knew that Riley was back in Meyerson. Xander had always been in love with her and was depressed after she rejected him. Gwen had been invited to the event as a special guest. Now that she was enjoying the entrepreneurial success as the founder of a listed company, she wanted to give back to her alma mater. She created a scholarship program for the students of the College of Music and the College of Business to encourage young people to work hard. Gwen was chatting with the handsome guy who was trying to flirt with her. She saw Damon out of the corner of her eye. She lit up and excused herself from the conversation, then walked over to greet Damon. Hey there, handsome. How have you been? She glanced at Veronica. Oh, hey, Veronica. I didn't expect to see you here. Veronica smiled. Hello, Gwen. I hope you've been well. Damon also nodded to Gwen. Hi, he said indifferently. Gwen was curious why Damon was with Veronica. What about Fifi? Damon was so fickle. Are you here to attend the party? Gwen asked. Before Damon could answer, Veronica piped up. We're here to perform. Damon's going to sing a duet on stage with me. Gwen curled her lips and said, What's wrong, big boss? You can't answer questions yourself anymore? I know you're worth billions, but you can still act like an ordinary guy, can't you? Veronica's jaw dropped. What was Gwen talking about? As the guest mingled before the event began, Veronica widened her eyes when Gwen said that Damon was worth billions. What are you talking about? Gwen laughed. Don't you know? Veronica, you should be careful. If Damon hasn't told you the most important detail of his life, what else is he hiding from you? Gwen didn't mind seizing the opportunity to sow discord between Damon and Veronica. Damon glared at Gwen. Why was she throwing him under the bus? Veronica cocked her head to the side. What company is it? Gwen sneered at Veronica. He's the founder and CEO of Astromar. I bet you weren't expecting that. He keeps a low profile, but he runs one of the most successful startups in the world. Honestly, it's admirable. Our companies went public on the same day, and he was in high spirits. Veronica turned her head and looked at Damon curiously. She didn't look for trouble or question him. Instead, she said to Gwen, Are you performing tonight? Gwen shook her head. No, I just want to join in the fun. As they were talking, the man who was trying to flirt with Gwen walked over and called her. Although Gwen hated him, he was the son of a financial big shot, so she couldn't ignore him. He might be beneficial to her company in the future. So Gwen said to Damon, Talk to you guys later. She turned around and left. Once Gwen was out of earshot, Veronica crossed her arms over her chest. So, you're the founder of Astromar. Why haven't I heard you mention it before? Damon blinked innocently. You never asked. Veronica was indignant. How would she know to ask such a question? Wasn't that Damon lying by omission? Just as she was about to respond, there was a commotion in the crowd again. 
another big star had appeared. Damon and Veronica craned their necks to see who it was. Their jaws dropped to the floor. It was Avery. Damon shook his head and rubbed his eyes. He didn't think she'd come, but it was natural for her to be invited. What was even more surprising was the man on Avery's arm. It was Lorenzo Martinelli, the nightclub owner Damon had conflict with in the past. When Veronica saw Lorenzo, her face darkened. The first time she met him was at his nightclub. Lorenzo wanted to take advantage of Veronica, but he was suppressed by Damon. Damon had also run into Lorenzo at the airport when he picked up Fifi. What the hell was he doing with Avery? Lorenzo had high status in the city. When he appeared, the school leaders all came to greet him. Lorenzo had a cocky look on his face. Veronica squeezed his hand. Are you okay? I'm here for you if you need anything, she whispered. Damon didn't respond. He was rendered speechless. A woman stood next to Veronica and nudged her. Can you believe that Lorenzo Martinelli is here? He's an important figure. I think he's sponsoring this event. He's worth billions. Though Avery and Lorenzo weren't holding hands or publicly displaying affection, the fact that they stood side by side made Damon furious. He thought about what Avery said in her breakup letter about finding a man who was more outstanding than Damon. Was this what she meant? The more Damon thought about it, the more his heart pounded. Damon, don't be like this, Veronica murmured. She suddenly regretted bringing Damon to the party. It was supposed to be a distraction so he could get Avery off his mind and relax, but she didn't expect it to make Damon's mood even worse. Damon tried his best to calm himself down. I'm fine. Veronica guessed what Damon was thinking. Her heart ached for him. She bit her lip and said softly, Maybe it's not what you think. We don't want to jump to conclusions. I'm sure she still cares about you. Damon didn't say anything. His gaze was fixed on Avery. Sensing that someone was staring at her, Avery turned her head and made eye contact with Damon. She widened her eyes in surprise. She had a conflicted expression on her face, but Damon couldn't decipher what she was feeling. Avery looked down and noticed Veronica standing next to Damon and holding his hand. Avery frowned and turned away. Veronica tightened her grip on Damon's hand. It'll be okay. Let's just have fun, alright? The party began. The environment was festive, and apart from the scorned lovers, everyone was in a good mood. Damon and Veronica sat in the front row, waiting for their turn to perform their duet. Lorenzo, Avery, Levi, and Gwen, and the other honored guests sat close by. Damon shifted uncomfortably in his seat. He wished he had never agreed to attend the party. The last thing he wanted to do was perform in front of Avery and Lorenzo. At the start of the gala, as expected, many celebrities went on stage to sing and were met with thunderous applause from the audience. The radio station was broadcasting the event, and the audience members whipped out their phones to live stream the concert on social media. The tickets to the party had been expensive and seating was limited, thus it created an air of exclusivity. Those who couldn't afford to attend eagerly watched the live stream and listened to the broadcast, fantasizing that they were there. Riley got on stage and performed a violin sonata. She'd been working with a professional violinist for a while, and her skills had improved tenfold since Damon last heard her play. Everyone closed their eyes and swayed back and forth, allowing the beautiful sound of the strings to wash over them like waves of sunshine. The two students who followed her were juniors enrolled at the College of Music. Though they weren't as prominent as Riley, they still received a polite round of applause. Professors and school leaders took the stage to welcome the guest and make a few announcements. Then they had a short intermission. Levi performed at the top of the second half of the show. He sang the song Traveling Man. He was originally supposed to perform with his boy band, Heart Shaped Box, but they weren't able to clear their schedules. However, his solo performance was better than anyone remembered. Damon had taught him the song years ago before when they lived in the dorms. Though Levi was now a huge pop sensation, the song still carried a distinctive Ryan Gold style. Perhaps that had something to do with Levi's newfound popularity. People cheered and whistled even more than they had with Riley's violin sonata. Levi, don't get off the stage, please sing another song. Levi, you're the best. The crowd was enthusiastic. The screams and applause lasted for a long time. Even the organizers of the College of Music at Meyerson University were surprised, but they were also proud. After all, they had trained Levi and taught him everything he knew. The host stood at the podium and said, I understand how much you all like Levi. He has a great stage presence, doesn't he? I promise you'll like our new guest just as much as you like Levi. I am thrilled to invite Avery Wilson and Lorenzo Martinelli to sing on stage. Avery walked onto the stage. Lorenzo followed her. Damon raised his eyebrows. Lorenzo didn't know how to sing, did he? 
were they going to perform together? Veronica, who was sitting beside Damon, felt Damon was on the verge of going berserk. Veronica was worried. She held Damon's hand tightly and wanted to comfort him, but it didn't work. Veronica hesitated for a moment, then kissed his lips, not caring who saw them. Damon, I'm worried about you, she mumbled. I want you to have a good time. I'm willing to do anything to make sure you feel better. Damon's heart melted. Veronica had always been aloof, but now she took the initiative to kiss him in front of everyone. It instantly lifted his spirits. Thank you, he whispered back. You're a good person, Veronica. I'm happy to be here with you. Veronica saw that her kiss had worked. She felt an indescribable sweetness in her heart. But, Damon wanted to say something but stopped himself. Veronica opened her eyes wide. But what? Please tell me what's going on in your mind. Damon smiled shyly. Why don't you kiss me again? That'll make me feel even better. Veronica blushed and rolled her eyes at Damon. You're so naughty and insatiable. There was a smattering of applause. People whispered to one another, confused by why Lorenzo was performing with Avery. The host guessed what everyone was thinking and decided to elaborate. Mr. Martinelli is a generous philanthropist with a net worth of the billions of dollars. He owns a popular nightclub. His name is famous for his charity work and sizable donations. But many people are unaware that Mr. Martinelli is also a singer. He used to dream of being a musician. However, he made a difficult choice and focused on his business prospects instead. He's an outstanding person, a successful young entrepreneur, and has grown great musical talent. The host exaggeratedly gesticulated as he praised Lorenzo, trying to pump up the crowd and get them excited. Lorenzo proudly walked onto the stage and sang a song with Avery. The song was a tender duet, a love song meant to be sung by a man and woman. Damon's mood soured again. Why would Avery sing a song like that with a man in public if they weren't romantically linked? Why wouldn't Avery choose a different song when she noticed Damon was in the audience? Damon was annoyed to admit that Lorenzo wasn't a bad performer. He sang well, and it was obviously that he had gone through professional training. With Avery's effortless soprano voice, the song sounded gorgeous. Lorenzo wasn't as talented as Levi, but with Avery at his side, that didn't matter. Everyone clapped and cheered when the song finished. Avery and Lorenzo bowed to the audience, then tried to return to their seats, but the host ran up on stage and stopped him. The host shoved a microphone in Lorenzo's face. Mr. Lorenzo, do you care to say a word to your new fans? Lorenzo took the microphone and turned to address the crowd. Music's always been in my passion. When I was in middle school, I won an award at a talent competition, and I dreamed of becoming a famous singer. He cleared his throat. Unfortunately, my father thought it would be better for me to focus on sharpening my business acumen. Now that I've reached great success in my field, I can once again begin pursuing music as a hobby. Thank you so much for your kind support. Avery smiled at him encouragingly. He nodded and continued. It is my great pleasure to announce that I will donate $1 million to Meyerson University of College of Music. I hope my donation will nurture a new generation of extraordinary musical talents. The school leaders leapt to their feet and gave Lorenzo a standing ovation. They clapped until their hands were sore. The host beamed and took the microphone back from Lorenzo. This is extremely generous of you, Mr. Martinelli. Future students at the College of Music will thank you for years to come. Also, may I just say how beautiful you sounded while you sang the duet. It made me want to fall in love. It was one of the most gorgeous pieces of music I've ever heard in my life. Damon rolled his eyes. The host was sucking up to Lorenzo in a manner that was both obvious and nauseating. From the back of the room, the audience member booed. Stop bragging. He wasn't that great. I want to hear Damon and Veronica. The school leaders were afraid that Lorenzo would take back his donation, so they hurriedly shushed the loner deserter. It was Damon and Veronica's turn to perform. Veronica sat at the piano and smoothed out her dress, then stretched her fingers to prepare. Damon nodded at her. The crowd watched them in breathless silence. It had been two years since Veronica and Damon performed publicly together. They looked like the perfect couple. Damon wore the suit Veronica and Vicky purchased for him. Veronica's long hair cascaded down her back, and she wore a light blue evening gown that made her look like a winter queen. They had never looked more dazzling. Avery's eyes narrowed. She pursed her lips in disapproval. She was annoyed that Veronica looked so pretty. Everyone was staring at Damon and Veronica as if they'd hung the moon. Avery felt tears welling up in her eyes. She tried to blink them back so they wouldn't fall and destroy her makeup. Lorenzo's facial expression also became ugly. Back at the nightclub, he wanted to make a move on Veronica, and then Damon ruined his plan and made him lose face. Now Damon was here to thwart Lorenzo's big moment once again. 
How could Lorenzo allow Damon to get away with it? Damon and Veronica are on stage, preparing to play their duet. In the audience, Lorenzo's eyes shot daggers at Damon. A tear slowly rode down Avery's cheek. Veronica sat at the piano while Damon stood beside Veronica with a guitar in his hand. The spotlight showed down on Veronica, casting a warm glow around her like a halo. They closed their eyes and began to play. As soon as the first note started, everyone in the auditorium gasped. They were playing a new arrangement of Time Flies. Some students recognized the song from when Damon and Veronica hosted the radio show together. As they played, they occasionally opened their eyes and shot each other fruit of glances. The melody reverberated around the room until there wasn't a single dry eye in the audience. It was the best performance they'd given yet. Avery was trembling with envy. Damon had never played a sweet duet with her while they were dating. He always made excuses. How could he act so intimate with Veronica in front of thousands of people? The song ended. The applause almost blew the roof off the auditorium. The audience members cheered and whistled as they gave Damon and Veronica a standing ovation. Levi clapped until his hands were sore. Though he was a famous pop star, he didn't mind that people applauded more than they applauded him. He was proud of his friend and their shared success. Gwen and Riley leaned closer to each other to talk. What do you think it would be like to play a duet with Damon? Gwen whispered. Riley shrugged. It'd be nice. I underestimated his talent and stage presence. Lorenzo overheard Riley and Gwen's conversation. I don't think it was that great, he scoffed. The piano sounded fine, but the guitar playing and male vocals were mediocre at best. He was annoyed that Damon received so much praise. This was supposed to be Lorenzo and Avery's big night. Damon was the last person he expected to upstage him and make him look bad. The host, who stood not far from Lorenzo, was eager to suck up to their biggest donor. I agree with you, Mr. Martinelli. The piano was lovely and Veronica is a beautiful singer, but the guitar was just subpar. Why don't you and Avery perform another piece to outshine the last performance? The host was lying through his teeth, but he was determined to stroke Lorenzo's ego in hopes that Lorenzo would donate more money to the College of Music. Various school administrators nodded in agreement. Yes, it sounds like Damon just recently learned to play guitar. He still needs professional training. To an outsider, it might sound good, but to music experts, it's off-key. You did a much better job than he did, Mr. Martinelli. His skills are basic compared to yours. Regardless of whether it was right or wrong, they had to make Lorenzo happy. Some of their students overheard the undeserved flattery and muttered about it under their breaths. They were losing respect for the revered professors and administrators. How could their leaders not see that Damon's talent far surpassed Lorenzo's? Levi decided it was time to speak up. He couldn't stand listening to people slander one of his best friends, and he had nothing to lose. You know what? Everyone, Damon's guitar playing skills are excellent. You all need to get your ears checked. He's even better than I am. The school leaders were shocked. Was their former star student admitting that he was inferior to Damon? The dean of the College of Music, Bonnie Castillo, couldn't take it anymore. Levi, you're so good at playing guitar. You don't need to be humbled to defend your old friend. Levi shook his head. Dean Costillo, I'm telling the truth. He placed notes that I couldn't figure out if I spent 10 years practicing. It's incomparable. Ma'am, with all due respect, you're an artist. Don't forget your moral compass and artistic integrity. Ask your conscience if Damon's guitar playing and vocals were as bad as you say. Dean Costillo turned red up to the hairline. She knew in her heart that Levi was right, but she didn't want to insult Lorenzo after his generous donation. You're a leading figure in the entertainment industry. You've inspired your peers substantially and your influence has motivated many of our current students. Levi, you've never had an issue with your confidence or self-esteem in the past. Why are you going to bat for Damon? Before Levi could respond, Gwen stood up and chimed in. Dean Costillo, Levi is right. And you know it. Levi is a great musician, but you can't possibly think that Damon is a bad guitar player. Do you even know Damon's background? Dean Costillo opened her mouth and closed it. Although there had always been rumors that Ryan Gold was at Myerson University, it had never been confirmed. Dean Costillo heard rumors just like everyone else, but she thought they were baseless. The Dean had her eyes and ears in every corner of the university. If the rumors were true, surely she would know. Dean Costillo frowned. No, tell me, who is he, Gwen? Gwen looked at Dean Costillo with disdain. When Gwen was a student, she was careful to not make waves with the professors or school administrators. However, she had already graduated and had a successful career. She'd also donated to the College of Music. 
The school leaders couldn't afford to offend her any more than they could afford to insult Lorenzo. He's Ryan Gold. You're the dean of the College of Music. How could you have not heard the rumors? Dean Costello's jaw dropped. It was never confirmed, she said, trailing off. Levi piped up. Dean, it's true. I learned a lot from my professors here at Meyerson, but Damon taught me more about music than all of them combined. He's Ryan Gold. The venue erupted with excited whispers. Oh my god, Ryan Gold's more handsome than I ever imagined. Do you think he's dating Veronica? If not, maybe I'll date him. People began to chat their favorite pop star's name. It started quietly, then slowly rose into an echo through the auditorium. Ryan Gold! Ryan Gold! When he heard the cheers, Lorenzo's face darkened. He'd always thought highly of himself, but once again, Damon had slapped him in the face. Lorenzo wanted to come to the party to relax and show off his wealth. He didn't expect that jerk Damon would mess things up again. Lorenzo was so angry that his whole body shook. Dean Castillo put her hands on her hips. She knew it wasn't good for her department if Lorenzo was upset. Everyone calm down. Even if Damon is Ryan Gold, he still isn't as special as you think he is. She was met with countless boos from the audience. Even her colleagues looked at her like she was an idiot. Dean Costillo sighed. All right, I'll admit that Damon isn't a bad musician. But in terms of intelligence, he can't compare to Lorenzo. Lorenzo Martinelli uses his talents in business field. With a current net worth of billions, I think Mr. Martinelli has every right to feel superior to others. The audience was frustrated with Dean Costillo's statement. There are so many people who know how to do business. How many of them are musical geniuses? Someone shouted. You deny Ryan Gold's talent? This is unforgivable. Another student cried out. Dean Costillo, we used to respect you, but now we realize you're nothing but a sellout who would say anything for a cheap buck. Dean Costillo's face was ashen. She hoped the event would go smoothly, but now everyone was turning against her. Gwen crossed her arms over her chest and addressed the Dean. Ma'am, I'm afraid you don't know what you're talking about. Not only is Damon Ryan Gold, but he's also the founder of Astromar. Oh right, I heard that the College of Music is plagued with financial woes and budget cuts. Today, the CEO and the biggest shareholder is standing right in front of you. You don't want to offend someone with Damon's level of power. Dean Costello shook her head and pinched herself in the arm as if trying to wake up from this nightmare. Gwen continued, I understand you were exhausted about Lorenzo's donation, but Damon has much more money. Lorenzo's wealth is paltry in comparison to Damon's. Additionally, Damon is a Meyerson alumnus. Lorenzo didn't even have a chance to attend the school. If you want to flatter and suck up to someone, don't you think you have better chance with Damon? Gwen hadn't expected herself to defend Damon, but she couldn't stand Lorenzo's behavior. She also had an ulterior motive. She knew that Damon liked to keep a low profile and not flaunt his riches. She was annoyed that Damon never asked her on a date, so she wanted to expose the fact that he had money. In any case, he had so much money that he couldn't spend it all in three lifetimes. It was only right for him to give back to his alma mater. These words were earth-shattering. How could Damon be both a famous pop star and the founder of the most successful startup of his generation? Dean Costello and her colleagues exchanged nervous glances. They weren't sure whether or not to trust Gwen's assertions, but they didn't dare to defy her because she was also donating money to the College of Music. Dean Costello broke out into a cold sweat. She'd been defending Lorenzo with all of her might. The College of Music is in a financial crisis, and Lorenzo had pledged $1 million to their department. Dean had invited Lorenzo as a special guest in hopes of getting money from him. She'd spent a lot of the time and effort to get him to agree to come to the party. But if Gwen's words were true, Dean Costello was still stuck between a rock and a hard place. Please tell me this is all some sort of sick joke. Dean muttered. Gwen rolled her eyes. Do I look like someone who would joke about something like that? This is a serious matter. Damon and Veronica were still on stage, unsure of how to handle the situation. The auditorium was pin drop quiet. Dean Costello turned her gaze to Damon. She was flustered. Excuse me, are you the founder of Astromar? Damon hesitated for a minute, then slowly nodded. Damon had officially stolen the spotlight from Lorenzo. He couldn't compete with Damon in terms of power, talent, or wealth. Lorenzo was enraged. He looked at Damon from head to toe and said with a cold smile on his face, So, you're the founder of Astromar. No wonder you're so arrogant. 
Just because you have money and power doesn't mean you can do whatever you want without facing consequences. Damon cocked his head to the side and regarded Lorenzo. Is that what you think? It sounds like you're talking about yourself, not me. Lorenzo clipped his weapons in his hand. He was so angry he couldn't speak. Damon turned his eyes to Avery, who had been silent the whole time. Is this guy your new lover? He doesn't look like much. That's a weird choice, Avery. There was a hint of ridicule between his brows. Avery was baffled. She hadn't known that Damon was the founder of Astrobar, but she also didn't like that he was criticizing her choices in front of almost a thousand people. A complicated look flashed across her face. Damon, that's none of your business. Anyway, it seemed like you moved on with my old friend Veronica. Are you happy? Veronica ducked her head and looked at the piano. She didn't want to be dragged into it. Damon raised his chin confidently. You bet I'm happy. Avery quivered like a leaf. I do know one thing. Breaking up with you is the best decision I've ever made. Lorenzo arched an eyebrow and nudged Avery. Are you implying that you dated that clown? Avery nodded. He's my ex-boyfriend, but I want nothing more to do with him for as long as I live. Lorenzo tugged on Avery's arm. Come on, let's go. We don't need to stay at this stupid party for a minute longer. Don't worry. I'll make sure your little ex here ends up in a financial ruin. He stood up and gestured to Avery to follow. She rose from her seat. Damon widened his eyes. Why are you following him? Avery froze in her tracks. She didn't know what to say and didn't want to further upset Lorenzo. Lorenzo pointed his finger at Damon. Is there a problem? Avery is now a singer of my talent agency. She belongs to me. Avery bit her lip. Damon, I'm trying to cut ties with you. Did you forget what I said in my letter? Avery couldn't believe she was in this position. Damon was an inspirational young man from South Rivertown who pulled himself up by his bootstraps and eventually became a wealthy man. However, his influence in the world couldn't compare to Lorenzo's. Avery still cared about Damon, but Lorenzo scared her. She didn't want to go against him. Despite Damon's protest, Avery followed Lorenzo out of the auditorium and disappeared into the night. Damon suspected that Avery was in danger, but there was nothing he could do about it at that moment. He vowed to make contact with her before she went out on her next contra tour to warn her about how dangerous Lorenzo was. After Lorenzo left, Damon stepped off the bridge. He was instantly mobbed by his fans. He politely shrugged them off. Dean Castillo appeared before him. Damon, Mr. Walker, do you think we can have dinner together and discuss the future of Meyerson's College of Music? Damon regarded the Dean Costillo coolly. Sorry, but my schedule is full. I'm a busy man. Please feel free to contact my assistants, if you'd like to make a more formal appearance, to discuss business. Gwen, Levi, and Riley invited Damon and Veronica to go to a bar and have a drink. Damon and Veronica happily agreed, eager to escape the tense atmosphere of the party. At the bar, they talked about their feelings after graduation. Damon asked Levi if he had a girlfriend. Levi blushed, then confirmed that he indeed had a girlfriend. He promised to introduce her to Damon soon. Then, Damon asked Gwen if she had a boyfriend. Gwen looked at Damon meaningfully and shook her head. Veronica quietly pinched Damon under the table. She glanced at him and almost imperceptibly shook her head, as if indicating that she disapproved of this relationship with Gwen. Damon sighed. Would he ever break free of his complicated romantic entanglements? The flight from Meyerson landed smoothly on the ground in Europe. Lorenzo Martinelli led his team forward in a low-profile manner. They got into a taxi and sped toward a castle 50 miles from the airport to meet with several business tycoons. When Lorenzo arrived, the tycoons stood and applauded to welcome him. Lorenzo greeted them warmly. How's the financial situation? Lorenzo asked, sitting with him at the round table. One of the big shots popped open a bottle of champagne and said, I think the North American stock market is finally on the verge of collapse. Very good! Lorenzo exclaimed, when will it collapse entirely? The tycoons exchanged knowing glances. One of them spoke up. It's hard to say, but you're from the United States, so you might have a better handle on it on the ground. We need more money if we want to destroy the stock market. Lorenzo clasped his hands in front of him and leaned forward. I can provide it. My company is ready to donate nearly a billion dollars to the cause in cash. As soon as he said that, the big shots in the castle drew in a deep breath of cold air. Nearly a billion dollars in cash. That was enough to begin the financial tidal wave. An old man with white hair shook his head. Mr. Martinelli, I do hope you're not pulling our legs. Lorenzo sipped his champagne. 
I want to get revenge on someone specific, and this is the best way to do it. When Lorenzo thought about Damon, he had a hard time not going crazy. Not only did he want to destroy Astromar, but he also wanted to break Damon's heart. Now that he had Avery, Lorenzo wouldn't easily let her slip from his grasp. He decided to sign Avery to his talent agency to keep an eye on her. In the past, Avery was contracted under Tony Music Entertainment. Later on, Damon also joined in on the shares. However, Lorenzo convinced Avery that he could help her become a much bigger star. He persuaded her to break her contract with Tony Music Entertainment and sign with him instead. Lorenzo wanted the first concert of her tour to take place in Meyerson. Without a doubt, Avery's influence was unprecedented. The Meyerson Super Stadium could accommodate 20,000 people, and it was filled to the brim. Fans waved lighters and glow sticks in the air and cheered for Avery. Damon was busy with his career all day and almost didn't pay much attention to Avery's improvement in her music career. He decided to buy a ticket to the concert and see if he could talk to her backstage when she was finished. Avery's singing was now many times more elegant than before. On the stage, she was wearing a baby blue, off-the-shoulder dress and a pair of silver, glittery high heels. She looked like a moon goddess under the glow of the spotlight. Her fans went wild and begged for her an encore. Damon wanted to find an opportunity to get close to Avery, but when he saw Lorenzo waiting for her, Damon's heart became cold. Avery! Damon called out. Avery's body trembled. Is something the matter? Avery asked, trying to sound cold and indifferent. Damon sighed. I have some things to discuss with you. Can you please come back with me? Avery gave him an aloof smile. Damon, can't you see the situation? How many times have I said it? We can't get back together. Lorenzo sneered at Damon. Get lost, loser. Avery is my girlfriend now. You had your chance and you blew it. I control her every move and she likes it that way. Avery followed Lorenzo to the parking lot without another word to Damon. Damon chased after them, but they were already in the car. Damon's blood ran ice cold when he saw Avery talking and laughing with Lorenzo. Lorenzo leaned over and nibbled Avery's ear. He made eye contact with Damon from the rolled down window and gave him the middle finger. Damon began to sweat. He didn't have a good feeling about the situation. When he first saw Avery with Lorenzo, he thought that she was trying to get back at him, but now his illusions were dashed. Damon had always been deceiving himself. Although he had told himself a thousand times that he and Avery weren't compatible, this felt like the final nail in the coffin of their relationship. Damon's heart broke more than ever. He wished he could stab Lorenzo in the gut and whisk Avery away. Damon watched Avery disappear into the distance. There was nothing he could do. As Avery's world tour began, a global financial war broke out. The stock market shook violently and created a ripple effect. Countless shining economic upstarts fell into the ground after being robbed by the financial storm. Even middle-class investors went bankrupt overnight and had no choice but to shutter their businesses and sell their homes. It was swiftly evolving into a life-or-death situation. Several international financial groups joined the battle, including Astromar, the Brokerton Group, and Season Capital. Even Fifi's mother, Karen Harper, participated in the fight. The Brokerton Group and Season Capital experienced their share of prices plummeting. The financial world was solely panicking as mysterious investors began to illegally pump and dump their shares. Someone was cheating people out of their hard-earned money. The Brokerton Group was one of the biggest victims. Apart from the malicious fraud, someone was out to destroy their reputation and spread negative news about the corporation. Some of the news leaked to the public was confidential. The higher-ups in the Brokerton Group suspected they had a spy in their midst. No one trusted each other anymore. Astromar also suffered greatly. They were being targeted, and it was a huge setback. In the thick of the financial crisis, Avery's tour went as planned. However, at the third stop on her tour, she ran into major issues. Avery's costume that night included a veil over her face. She wanted to create an air of mystery, but she was trying to hide something she didn't want her fans to see. Unfortunately, a gust of wind blew into the outdoor concert venue. Her veil lifted from her face. The audience received a good look at her face on the jumbotron that filmed her every move. Her beautiful face had been slashed to ribbons. It looked like someone had cut her with scissors or a knife. The scars were deep and devastating. How had she become so disfigured? It caused a huge commotion. The tens of thousands of audience members watching Avery's performance were stunned. They couldn't believe their eyes. Avery panicked when the veil flew up. She quickly fled the stage, her hands over her face, but the damage was done. The tour had to end. 
The next day, the news of Avery's global tour being halted and Avery's disfigured face splashed the front page of websites and social media platforms all over the world. Everyone speculated about what happened to her. Some people tried to make excuses and suggest she was mauled by a cat. Others scoffed the idea. A simple house cat couldn't have destroyed her face so thoroughly. It didn't look like an accident. Others formed conjectures that Avery had an affair. The rumor was that Avery was dating a super rich person and then she cheated on him with a young man. Then she gave all the money from her boyfriend to her lover. Later, the rich man found out what Avery did and cut off Avery's source of funds. And the young man disfigured Avery and ran off without getting any money. No one knew where the rumors began, but the evil assertions of Avery's promiscuity began to damage her reputation. It was as if there was an invisible hand behind it, pushing the spread of the news. Damon received numerous phone calls from his concerned friends, asking him what happened between him and Avery. They wanted to know if Damon had further information and if the rumors were true. Damon was unable to answer their questions. As the financial situation became more turbulent, the Brokerton Group and Astromark Group had enough on their plate as it was. Damon was worried about Avery, but he didn't have time to participate in baseless accusations against the woman he used to love. He focused on his work and prayed that Avery was okay. Finally, he couldn't take it anymore. His intuition told him Avery was in danger. He tried to contact her, but her phone was off. He had no idea where she was. His heart raced. He needed to do something quickly, but what? At 2.30 p.m. in a rented apartment in Los Angeles, a girl wearing a mask was packing her luggage. A few staff members from Lorenzo's talent agency barged in. One of the women glowered at Avery. Lorenzo instructed you to pack your things at Scram. The company has already terminated your contract, and your global tour has also been canceled. It was Ursula, the woman Fifi had a conflict with at the airport. She had always been jealous of Avery's talent and Lorenzo's favoritism toward Avery. Now that Avery was on her way to being physically and psychologically ruined, Ursula was giddy. Avery covered her face with a hat. She blankly packed her luggage and didn't say anything. What are you dawdling for? What, do you think you're still a superstar? Ha! Ursula put her hands on her hips defiantly. Avery ignored her. Ursula wouldn't drop the matter. Why are you bothering to pack up those tattered clothes anyway? It's not like they're designer goods. You'd better be going to a thrift store when you reach your next destination. Ursula leaned down and flipped Avery's suitcase onto the ground. Tears welled up in Avery's eyes. Two small bags of white powder fell to the floor. Ursula reached over and snatched the bags. What are you, doing drugs now? Please give me my stuff back. Avery whimpered. Ursula shook her head. We all know that you did this to yourself to avoid Lorenzo. You're not the beautiful superstar you once were, and you'll never recover from this. Ursula gestured to the other employees of the talent agency and slammed the door behind her with so much force the windows rattled. Avery was humiliated. She wept tears of despair. She silently gathered the remainder of her belongings, including sentimental items given to her by the person she loved the most. When she dragged her suitcase out of the hotel, she was aimless. She wandered for a while before she arrived at the plaza that was broadcasting the news about the financial crisis. A banner with rumors about Avery played at the bottom of the screen. Astromar's share price had fallen by 40% and the Brokerton Group's market value had been cut in half. Ordinary people who invested their meager funds in the stock market found themselves victims. Their wealth was now worth practically nothing. On the big screen, financial analysts tried to decipher what was happening. No one knew what to do in the face of this unprecedented economic crisis. When Avery saw Damon's Astromar share price drop, she opened her mouth and muttered under her breath to no one in particular, you can't beat him. At night, Lorenzo sat in his luxurious home in Europe, listening to the reports of his subordinates regarding this financial storm. Tomorrow, increase the funds and then throw all the shares down. Lorenzo said. He planned to break through the psychological defense of all the shareholders and make the shares drop even more. When all the shareholders went crazy, the interest groups that Lorenzo represented would purchase those high-quality assets at a low price. The next morning, as the stock exchange door opened, everything went according to plan. Lorenzo felt it would be a beautiful day. He rubbed his hands in anticipation for his evil scheme going off without a hitch. However, just before the markets closed for the day, a miracle occurred. An extraordinary amount of money flowed into the major trading markets. The stock prices crept up, with only half an hour remaining on the clock. What's going on? What's going on? When it was time to close the transaction, Lorenzo's face turned ashen. 
As they organized and sold on a large scale, the small investors and security companies that followed them would also sell their shares. This was throwing a major wrench in his plot. Who was behind all this? Where were the shareholders gaining capital? Lorenzo was getting nervous. He paced around the room with his hands clasped behind his back, glancing anxiously at the news out of the corner of his eye. He called his colleagues, partners, to figure out who was behind the sudden reversal, but no one had any information. It was all happening too fast. Lorenzo flopped into a chair and cradled his head in his hands. He thought he had all of his ducks in a row. Who would dare intervene? The next day, the sun rose as usual. The fierce financial war raged on. As soon as the market opened, Astamar and the Brokerton Group were emptied by a powerful force. Investors were purchasing shares at low prices, causing a scarcity mindset, so others did the same. Once the shares were purchased, the original investors turned around and sold them at a much higher price. The illegal pump and dump operation was being carried out by Lorenzo and his business partners. They did everything in their power so their names wouldn't be linked to buying and selling frenzy. When it was time to close the market at that day, the share prices of Astamar and the Brokerton Group plummeted once again. Lorenzo was pleased with his plan once again. He thought Damon would fight back harder, but Lorenzo was elated to see that even an entity as powerful as Astamar struggled to weather the financial tsunami Lorenzo orchestrated. To teach Astamar and the Brokerton Group a lesson, Lorenzo discussed the matter with capitalists and consortiums from all over the world and reached a consensus. He planned to reap the shares of Astamar and the other companies after the share prices fell to a certain number. Lorenzo didn't want to admit it to his colleagues, but for him, the situation was personal. He hated Damon with every fiber of his being. If Lorenzo could trample Astamar under his feet, Damon's inevitable fall from grace would be the best revenge Lorenzo could think of. Lorenzo kept a close eye on the market fluctuations. The share prices were currently exceeding his expectations, but he still felt he had a firm grip. On the third day, Lorenzo was hit with something he didn't expect. Astamar's prices skyrocketed. Lorenzo's chips were down and he was losing his grip. Astamar's shares rose 8%, then 10%, then 12. Lorenzo's cash flow was drying up. He had used almost all of his money to take advantage of the market and then resell his stocks at a higher price. For the first time, Lorenzo felt like failure was in sight. Astamar and the Brokerton Group had been operating for many years and they had sufficient cash flow to deal with the crisis. On the fourth day, Lorenzo and the financial groups behind him launched another powerful tsunami-like attack. His colleagues pulled their assets together, ready to fight to the death. They began a wicked disinformation campaign about Astramar and the Brokerton Group and spread nasty rumors. If they played their cards right, Astramar would undoubtedly suffer another heavy blow. Small corporations and hobby investors wouldn't feel safe buying shares from Astramar or this Brokerton group. The investments were too risky. Lorenzo clapped his hands excitedly. Astamar's finished. Not even the gods could save them now. I'll knock it down and suck its blood until the horrendous company begs for mercy. People outside of the financial world were starting to pay attention. As a student of the financial college, Veronica had studied almost all the great wars in the financial field and had unique views on the subject. She decided to join Damon's team and act in the role of an advisor. Frank and Emily Francis were also closely following the news. They were worried and frustrated. They paced in the living room of the Francis family home, wringing their hands and unsure how to help. Emily's new boyfriend, Diego, was annoyed that Emily was so obsessed with the stock market. He crossed his arms over his chest. Why are you staring at these stocks every day? When did you become interested in finance? Did you invest in Astramar? He grumbled. Emily rolled her eyes. My friend is in trouble. Anyway, this financial crisis could affect us all. Damon has never disappointed me. I have no doubt he'll make miracles happen. Diego frowned. Marry him, why don't you? He muttered under his breath, but even he had to admit that watching the stock market rise and fall so dramatically was exciting. Gwen's market value was also affected. It had fallen to nearly half from its peak. She understood that the capital used to start the financial war didn't just come from a single financial group. It came from hundreds of thousands of powerful capitalists in the world, intending to rob ordinary shareholders and corporations blind. When they were finished, nothing would be left. But Gwen didn't know what to do. She kicked herself for going public with her company. If she'd stayed unlisted, she wouldn't be nearly as sensitive to the violent fluctuations of the market. Now that Phoebe was in charge of her mother's company, she felt the cold winds of the crisis blowing in her direction. She worked tirelessly to batten down the hatches and protect her family business. 
Her main motivation was the assumption that once all this was over, she could live with Damon as a husband and wife, like she'd always wanted to. She prayed day and night that the storm would blow over and the consequences wouldn't be too dire. Fifi had never cared about a person as much as she cared about Damon. He was the only person she truly loved in her whole life. If he couldn't find a way out of this mess, what would become of the life she wanted to create with him? Since the first time she met Damon at the boys' dormitory, she had a special feeling about him. He amazed her with his talent and skill. For example, he taught Levi how to play guitar. He had also taught her how to drive the Bentley in snow. Fifi had no doubt in her mind that Damon could figure out a creative solution before the global economy collapsed completely. At the Brokerton Mansion in Los Angeles, the family was on pins and needles. Miranda pointed at the television screen. Grandma, look at Damon's current situation. He's being bullied. What are we going to do? Miranda felt aggrieved when she saw the Brokerton Group and Astromar besieged by an enormous amount of international capital. June was furious as well. Damon was now the feather in the Brokerton family's cap. If the Brokerton family name was dragged through the mud, June didn't know how they could recover. June sighed. For the past few days, I have been talking about these things with your grandfather. When has our family ever been attacked like this? And my grandson, I'm worried about his safety. What's Grandpa Everett saying about the matter? Miranda asked, sipping her coffee. He hasn't mentioned anything to me. June shook her head. I don't know for now. However, your grandfather went to socialize today, and he said he was meeting some old friends to discuss the issue. He should be coming back any minute. As soon as she finished speaking, they heard footsteps coming from outside. Then Grandpa Everett walked into the courtyard with a group of men. They talked over each other, all asserting their different opinions about the financial war. One of them had white hair and was dressed in military uniform. He was the same age as Grandpa Everett. The other man wore a sharp business suit. The old man dressed in military attire was Emily and Frank's grandfather, Mac Francis. The man in the suit was Alex's grandfather, Louis Thompson. Back in the day, the three old men fought in the war together. As the years went on, their different political opinions caused them to stop interacting with each other. However, because of Damon's friendship with Emily, Frank, and Alex, the three old men walked together once again. June knew Mac and Louie well, but she hadn't seen them in years due to her husband's grudges against them. She was so shocked she forgot to offer them something to drink. Grandpa Everett puffed at his chest. Dear June, let's show my two old friends our famous Brokerton hospitality. Invite them to take a seat and pour them some coffee, please. June could see that her husband was in a good mood. She came back to her senses. Oh, forgive me. Please take a seat, gentlemen. Can I offer you some coffee or tea? Mac looked at the elders of the Brokerton family and said with mixed emotions, It has been many years since we last met. I'm ashamed to say that we have to rely on your grandson Damon to resolve our misunderstanding. I hope that our children and grandchildren will no longer be as petty as we were in the past. Let's sit together and develop a future. On the tenth day, the stock market shook violently, and grief filled the land. The scale of the financial storm was beginning to affect people who hadn't been previously affected. The market was in a state of rapid decline. Astromar and the Brokerton Group were still at the forefront. No one dared to invest in Astromar. The share prices fell sharply, and their capital shrunk. Moreover, the crisis was no longer limited to the stock market. It started to have an overflow effect. Los Angeles' property market value also started to fluctuate. The housing bubble was about to burst. Banks began to foreclose on houses. Middle-class homeowners were facing a future of living on the streets. Lorenzo relaxed in front of the television at his castle in Europe. He gleefully watched the news, taking a celebratory shot of whiskey with every point Astromar fell. Lorenzo was about to be so rich that he wouldn't be able to spend the money in a hundred lifetimes. He was a selfish and arrogant man who didn't care about innocent people, and companies caught in the crossfire of the attack he'd helped to launch. Lorenzo still wasn't finished destroying Damon. He held a meeting with his colleagues to determine the right moment. When the time came, he would take complete control of Astromar's shares. He chuckled evilly at the television screen. Damon, I'll make you die an ugly death. I'll make you kneel at my feet and bark like a dog. As long as he could get control of Astromar, Lorenzo would hold a shareholder meeting and dismiss Damon from all of his duties with the company. Damon's team would be fired, and Lorenzo would usher in a new era of power and influence. Victory was within his grasp. Avery had spent a depressing week by herself. In an old boarding house, she packed her small suitcase. She decided to change her life. She would go to Europe to pursue a graduate degree and rid herself of the grief she experienced in the United States. 
She turned on her laptop and scrolled until she found the latest news about the stock market. Then she sat in front of the computer, took out a piece of paper and a pen, and started to write slowly. She wanted to write Damon another letter. She had so many things to say to him, but she couldn't muster up the courage to call, so she could only put it down in writing. Avery's face paled when she watched Ashtamar's prices continue to fall. She wondered if Damon was finally meeting his demise. No matter how many resources he had, it was impossible to reverse the situation. At noon, Avery finished writing the letter and called Veronica. Veronica, can you come to meet me? I have something to give you. Veronica was surprised that Avery called her. She didn't expect Avery to take the initiative to contact her after breaking up with Damon. When she arrived at Avery's residence, Veronica was taken aback. Although it was clean, it was a little crude. Why would Avery live in such a humble place? Avery was still as charming as before. She was still wearing a gauze veil over her face. Veronica didn't want to stare, though she could still see the faint outlines of scars beneath the veil. Veronica, here's a letter. Can you pass it to Damon for me? Avery took out the letter and said softly. Veronica furrowed her brow. Avery, what's wrong? Why don't you want to hand it over to Damon face to face? I'm sure he'd want to hear from you in person. Avery shook her head. I can't. I don't want to see him again. Please just promise me you'll take good care of him. Tears flowed from Avery's eyes. Veronica, I've already bought a plane ticket to Florence and am going to study my master's degree. I don't know if I'll be able to see you again in the future. Veronica widened her eyes. You want to go to Florence? Yes. The flight is at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Thank you. Please pass the letter to Damon for me. If fate brings us together, we'll meet again. She stuffed the letter into Veronica's outstretched palm and grabbed the handle of her suitcase. Veronica tugged on Avery's sleeve. Avery, wait. I still have something to say to you. It's over, Veronica. Just leave me in peace. Avery disappeared into the sunlight, leaving Veronica dumbfounded at the door. Veronica didn't read the contents of the letter. She still had more respect for Avery than that. She headed straight to the Astromar headquarters to find Damon. The appearance of the founder of Astromar caused a sensation at the headquarters. Damon was immediately flocked by concerned employees who wanted to offer their analysis of the financial crisis. Quinn rushed up to greet Damon. His expression was grim. Damon, it's good to see you, but I'm afraid we're in the middle of a crisis. Our cash flow is drying up and our share prices continue to plummet. Damon nodded and went to the conference room. The huge screen in the meeting room was broadcasting the fluctuation of Astromar's stock price. Damon frowned. The rest of the employees were even more nervous. They suspected that Astromar wouldn't be able to survive this crisis. If they did manage to crawl out of the pit, they would still suffer heavy losses. Damon was a legend at Astromar. His team had always looked up to him, but now they were beginning to feel hopeless. Look, quick, look, it's falling again. Someone cried out in alarm. Everyone turned toward the big screen. Chills ran down their spines. What should we do now? Is there no hope anymore? The company employees were anxious. Quinn gritted his teeth. In the face of this level of financial turmoil, even if Astromar wanted to buy back their shares, they were powerless. The enemy had too many chips in their hands. Quinn had long suspected that the enemies from overseas were teaming up to tear down Astromar. If that was the case, they were going against an entity far more powerful than they had the resources to fight. No matter how strong Astromar was, they would never be able to stop it. Even if they had enough cash flow, it would be difficult for them to protect themselves. Damon had built Astromar from scratch. He had a humble background and always shied away from asking people for money or loans. Even people who knew nothing about economics could see the writing on the wall. The crisis would inevitably cause a recession. Houses were already being foreclosed upon. However, in the contrast to his peers, Damon looked confident. His relentless optimism was his biggest bargaining chip. At noon, Damon, Quinn, and the upper echelons of Astromar had a simple meal in the canteen of the Astromar building. During that time, Damon received a phone call, and a smile appeared on his face. Lorenzo, who was far away in Europe, watched the broadcast in high spirits. He stayed up all night due to the time's difference, cackling and clapping his hands. He wanted to squeeze the last drop of blood from Astromar. Everything is going according to my script. He had made a lot of money by selling off Astromar shares, but he wasn't finished yet. He would gain total control of the market. Then he would solely toy with Damon to death. This is truly a beautiful day. Lorenzo hugged his assistant and seemed pleased with himself. No one had linked his name in the crisis. He was a puppet master manipulating his marionettes behind the scenes. 
Lorenzo called one of his many girlfriends to celebrate getting his revenge. As they were about to have a passionate night together, someone knocked on the door. Lorenzo's eyes flashed with a fierce light. He hated people disrupting him when he was with one of his girlfriends. Come in, he growled. The door opened and a staff member rushed into the room. Lorenzo narrowed his eyes. You better give me a good reason for the disruptance. Otherwise, I'll kill you right now. I'm warning you. The staff member trembled. It's not looking good, boss. Astomar's share prices are rising. Lorenzo waved his hand dismissively. That's part of the plan. The market will continue to fluctuate. I'm not worried. If that's the only reason you barged in, then you'll have to face the consequences. The staff member's eyes widened. Boss, I think you'd better get up and take a look. This is serious. What did I say? Lorenzo hissed. Bang! Lorenzo whipped out his pistol and fired at the staff member. The employee collapsed to the ground, with blood flowing out of his head. Lorenzo's girlfriend screamed and hid under the sheets. She'd never seen someone so bloodthirsty. Lorenzo pocketed his pistol. I told him he'd have to face the consequences. He had fair warning, he said gruffly. The girlfriend shook with fear. She mustered up all of her courage and said, Lorenzo, babe, your staff is normally cautious. They wouldn't be so reckless unless it was a major event. Maybe you should take a look. Lorenzo saw how worried his girlfriend was. He frowned and thought for a while before walking out of the room. He still didn't think it was a big deal. The international financial giant that he represented was playing the entire world in the palm of his hand. Damon couldn't do anything about it. When Lorenzo arrived at the conference room, he froze. He rubbed his eyes as if he could erase what he was seeing. The staff was right. Astomar's share price had rebounded, but it was not the rebound that Lorenzo wanted. It was a direct reversal. Lorenzo nearly fainted on the spot. According to the time in the United States, the market would have opened in the afternoon for half an hour. Astomar had dropped 8 points before, but now it had increased by 50 points. The sudden increase of 50 points was terrifying and rare. What was even more terrifying was that Astomar had such a powerful stock. Along with Astomar's revenge, the Brokerton Group shares price also rose steadily. It rose by 25%. The market was frenzied. It was like a rebellion. The United States Stock Exchange rose and blew the horn of a counterattack. How is this possible? N no, it, this is impossible! Lorenzo cried, cradling his head in his hands. He figured they might retaliate, but never to this scale. Without a doubt, some heavyweight opponents used resources to pull their funds into the financial battlefield. They were swiftly catching up to Lorenzo. If the prices continued to rise, Lorenzo would be too short on capital. It would be fruitless for him to even try to control Astomar's shares. Quick, investigate what happened! Lorenzo roared. He called the financial tycoons who'd been working with him before, but no one could give him a straight answer. The tycoons suffered heavy losses when they emptied their funds. Some people had already investigated it, but they came up dry. After an hour of video conference, Lorenzo and his capitalist colleagues reached a consensus. They would never accept failure. They would go in guns blazing to see who was more powerful. Lorenzo didn't know how he got through the night. The next day, the bloodthirsty global funds started to gather in an orderly manner to focus on their plan of attack. They pumped as much capital as possible into the market until Astomar fell by more than 12%. When Quinn called Damon, Damon was eating breakfast with Vicky. When he found out Astomar had fallen by 12 points again, Damon only smiled and kept eating his scrambled eggs and bacon. Aren't you worried? Vicky furrowed her brow and sipped her coffee. I mean, this is a major crisis, Damon. It's not in my nature to be worried about something like this. Damon replied. He finished his breakfast and went to work at Astromar's headquarters. When everyone thought the explosive rebound from the day before was just a fleeting moment like in the past, Astromar's employees were horrified. Lorenzo had emptied his funds. The news stations breathlessly reported on the battle. It was like something out of a movie. Lorenzo could see that Astromar wanted to crush everything in its path. Lorenzo was angry and unwilling to accept it. The more they smashed the market, the more ferocious it became. No matter what the cost, we must destroy Astromar! Lorenzo wailed. His eyes were bloodshot from fury and lack of sleep. His girlfriend looked at him in horror. Lorenzo no longer had the heroic spirit of a strategist, but was instead like a gambler who lost all of his money and flew into a rage out of humiliation. Damon had a cool smile on his face. He was calm and relaxed. He never doubted for a moment that he would win. Quinn and his colleagues were sweating buckets, but they could only leave the solution up to Damon. A financial war of this level had gone beyond their imaginations. 
Their success, failure, life, and death were in Damon's hands. The data showed that countless large orders were selling Astromar's shares on a large scale, but Quinn knew that with Astromar's cash flow, it was impossible to raise the price of Astromar's shares. They were close to depletion. Yesterday, when Astromar rose 50 points, Quinn found it unbelievable. He couldn't understand it, no matter how much he racked his brain. What kind of money could support Astromar's shocking share price? It's being sold on a large scale again. What should we do now? Quinn asked, running his hand nervously through his hair. Damon picked up the phone. It's time to pull out the big guns. What? Quinn didn't understand. What funds? Damon, don't play with fire. This isn't something to joke about. We can't fight if we don't have at least a billion dollars. I'm not joking. You'll see. Damon smirked mysteriously and dialed a phone number. Within minutes, orders started pouring in for Astromar. Quinn and the others watched the screen in open mouth shock. How had Damon reversed the situation with a mere wave of his hand? At this moment of life and death, Avery, who was far away in Italy, also saw the news. She had arrived in Florence and had completed the application procedures and paperwork to enter the Academy of Arts for her graduate degree. She sat in her small apartment, her chin in her hands, trying to interpret the financial analyst's speculations. Suddenly, she had a realization. She gasped and almost fell out of her chair. Lorenzo had to be behind this. He was an international tycoon, but he confided in Avery that he was concerned about going into debt. He must have formed a team to harvest the world's wealth. However, if Damon used all of his connections to fight back, Lorenzo was just a drop in the ocean. He was nothing but a simple robber. Avery kept thinking about when she was still in South Rivertown. A heroic young man confessed his love to her, then risked his life to jump into the river to save Veronica. If he was capable of emotional and physical bravery, why would this be any different? In just five years, Damon had grown from a scrappy young man in a small rural town to a successful entrepreneur. He was now fighting with the world-class financial giant and used the entire global stock market as a platform. He was a hero. After thinking about it, Avery sighed softly. Although Astamar had retaliated yesterday and today, it still didn't change the fact that the decline would be difficult to recover from. But no matter whether or not Damon defeated the financial crocodiles at this time, the world would still remember his name. He would bounce back. Avery was sure of it. Lorenzo was consumed with his desire for revenge. He was on the verge of losing everything. There was no turning back. His situation looked bleaker by the second, but any retreat would cost him his life. Without a doubt, the success of Astromar's sneak attack meant that they had successfully blocked off the international market. The United States Stock Exchange once again soared. Lorenzo wanted to cry, but he had no tears. His coffer was empty. Lorenzo had no way of executing a counterattack. Individual investors, small index funds, hedge managers, and securities companies brandished large amounts of cash and entered the market. Then they began to buy high quality and cheap stocks as easily as buying chips and soda at the convenience store. When the market closed in the afternoon, Astromar was up 30 points, but the stock exchange as a whole was up 75%. What a monumental increase in the stock price. There had never been such a strong rebound. Everything is over. Facing the irreversible situation, Lorenzo let out a sorrowful roar. Lorenzo's schemes to overthrow the United States Stock Exchange had failed, and their losses were even more severe. What further terrified Lorenzo and his colleagues was that the reversal had also ignited the confidence of the individual shareholders. The power of the people couldn't be stopped, 